Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on revitalizing Kentucky's energy communities. I'll be your host, Briggs White. I'm with the National Energy Technology Laboratory, one of the Department of Energy's national labs and the Deputy Executive Director of the Interagency Working Group on Coal and Power Plant Communities and Economic Revitalization. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, start off with an icebreaker just to find out sort of who's on the call. Uh, so this is optional, uh, but if you would uh, please tell us uh, in the poll that's coming up now, uh, what part of Kentucky are you associated with? Uh, we have a, a number of different selections, or if you're from a, a different part of the country, um, uh, you can also put other in the chat. Um, so. Uh, again, uh, we have a chat functionality here where you can where you can just type in something or you can uh, put your entry into the poll. So while we're <clears throat> uh, giving folks time to uh, tell us where they're from uh, or maybe what part of the state they're associated with, uh, why don't we uh, do a brief agenda review today uh, to really talk about um, what we're here for and, and what's coming. So, uh, you know, today's event is really focused on uh, listening, uh, listening to uh, Kentucky voices and, and learning, uh, both to uh, uh, hear what the needs are, but also the opportunities and where the federal government in particular uh, can be helpful. Uh, we're also going to, uh, a little bit later on, uh, have a federal panel uh, that will actually respond uh, and provide some information in terms of resources. Uh, and so uh, after some opening remarks, we will have uh, our distinguished guest, the governor, uh, Andy Bashir, will will speak uh, with a through a video, uh, and then we will have uh, a panel of Kentucky voices followed by a Q and A. Importantly, we want to hear from you, uh, so please do interact um, in that Q and A session in particular using the chat function, and we'll try to have uh, an engaging conversation. A little later in the program, we'll have another keynote. Uh, with some brief remarks from our federal co-chair of the Appalachian Regional Commission, Gail Manchin, uh, and then a panel of federal experts, as I mentioned, uh, that will uh, provide uh, a brief overview uh, as well as stay around for a Q&A session. Uh, and these uh, these programs were, these uh, federal agencies were identified by Kentucky stakeholders as being some of the key ones. I will point out that the interagency working group includes 11 federal agencies plus OMB, so we don't actually have all of them on the federal panel. Nevertheless, we have invited their representatives to be in the audience today. So if you have a question for another federal rep that maybe isn't on the panel, feel free to drop it in the chat because there may be uh, someone from that agency in the audience as well. So after Q&A, we'll, we'll do, in, do some concluding remarks and that really uh, concludes our, our formal program. Just a, a few housekeeping reminders. Um, all attendees will be muted for today, but we do encourage you to participate um, in uh, by using the chat. Uh, so please do that. Uh, a reminder that this is being recorded. We will uh, post the recording and the slides uh, afterwards and send those out to all registered attendees and put them on the website for the interagency working group. So here we have a response. Uh, maybe folks are filtering in. We didn't get a ton of responses yet, so if you haven't uh, had a chance, maybe drop it into the chat. Uh, but it looks like um, most uh, most of the folks we have with us are from the eastern uh, coal fields, as well as the bluegrass or other parts of the state. So thank you for participating in that. That won't be our last poll of the day. Uh, we'll have another uh, handful of them that will help both provide input into today's agenda, but also more importantly, the substantive work of the interagency working group and really everything else that's going on here uh, as we endeavor to support uh, Kentucky energy communities. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Anderson. He is the director of the National Energy Technology Laboratory, but he also happens to be the executive director of the interagency working group uh, on coal and power plant communities and economic revitalization. He's going to provide a brief overview uh, of the interagency working group and really get everybody up to speed. And um, with that, why don't we go ahead and get Brian on the screen and uh, he can take it away. Briggs, thank you and, and good morning, everyone. And and uh, most importantly, thanks to those who are, are joining us today uh, from Kentucky or or from communities around the country who are interested in in uh, revitalizing America's energy communities. It's what we're, we're here about. It's what the 
uh, interagency working group was established uh, to do. And I'm, I'm going to just take a few minutes to introduce you uh, to the mission and the activities of the, the interagency working group, or we'll refer to it as the IWG uh, here this morning. As, as, as Briggs mentioned, the long name, the Interagency Working Group on Coal and Power Plant Communities and Economic Revitalization is really about trying to promote job creating investments in communities that have already been impacted by coal mine or power plant closures and for us to be proactive investing in the communities today that are likely to be impacted by additional near-term declines in coal production or generation from coal, coal fired power plants and in addition to that our oil and gas communities uh, around the country as well as part of the executive order 14008 which was signed on january 27th by by the president uh, titled Tackling the Climate Crisis Domestically and Abroad. In that executive order, the president established the IWG so that as we transition our nation's energy economy, we don't leave communities behind. And uh, and, and I'll take that just, just a, a, as an aside. Um, if you've followed the IWG or you're familiar with the National Energy Technology Laboratory, you know that NETL has been around for 111 years working on technologies um, related to the fossil energy industry. Everything from uh, coal uh, liquefaction and gasification to carbon dioxide sequestration and, and capture, um, and uh, the conversion of, of raw materials, coal raw materials, into value-added products. And certainly we partnered with uh, University of Kentucky and, and Louisville and the state of Kentucky uh, on many of these technologies and, and look forward to continuing that. Our priorities within the interagency working group are to drive the near term investments, certainly with with urgency and, and obviously the passage of the infrastructure bill uh, gives us a lot of tools at our disposal. And when I say our, I mean a whole of federal government approach, a whole of government approach and really all the way down to individuals who are in communities and care about uh, the, the people and workers and families and communities to make sure that we have uh, uh, vital communities with uh, with economic diversity. And so our, uh, as Briggs has mentioned, it's uh, 11 federal agencies plus uh, the Office of Management and Budget and the Domestic Policy Council. Those 11 agencies are the Department of Energy, as represented by uh, Briggs and myself and, and uh, Carla Frisch this afternoon or later this morning, uh, the Department of Treasury, Interior, Agriculture, Commerce, Labor, Health and Human Services, Transportation, Education, the EPA, and the Appalachian Regional Commission. And so these 11 agencies were brought together with real purpose. Uh, when we think of the uh, the complex nature of economic revitalization and, and the challenges faced by our communities, we need all of these programs across these 11 agencies. And so we're bringing them all together uh, to create a centralized one-stop shop clearinghouse so that energy communities have a lower barrier to accessing the types of resources that they need. As a quick aside, before I uh, pass along to a, to a video that summarizes a lot of what I what I just said, but in a, in a more concise way, I'll mention that I, in fact, my my family is from Eastern Kentucky. We were we're a Pike County family. Originally moved to West Virginia and have been here for a few a few generations. And so coal and coal communities and coal coal mining communities is in my blood. And in fact, my father grew up in a, in a coal camp uh, myself. So this is this is a, an effort of passion across all the agencies. And we're really excited to be with you uh, folks from, from Kentucky today. So let's let's roll the video, Bill. For generations, America's coal, oil, and gas and power plant communities fueled America's prosperity. Now, however, as our climate crisis worsens and the nation transitions to a clean energy economy, many energy workers and their communities are struggling. To meet the moment head on, President Biden, during his very first week in office, signed an executive order creating an interagency working group, or IWG, on coal and power plant communities and economic revitalization. It's led by senior White House officials, the U.S. Department of Energy, and 12 total federal agencies. For the first time, all working closely together to bring immediate support to energy communities. We're never going to forget the men and women who dug the coal and built the nation. We're going to do right by them, make sure they have opportunities to keep building the nation in their own communities and getting paid well for it. As a first step, the IWG was directed to prepare an actionable report to the president for it. They sought input directly from representatives from coal, oil and gas and power plant communities, labor unions, 
community development organizations, local, regional, and tribal governments, philanthropic interests, and the private sector. The IWG's initial report to the President maps out a detailed path forward to marshal government-wide resources to prioritize grant making, federal loan programs, technical assistance, financing, procurement, and other programs to offer immediate and long-term support to revitalize the economies of the nation's coal, oil, gas, and power plant communities. The IWG identified $38 billion in existing funding authorities from across the government available to support economic revitalization in energy communities across the country. And new money is starting to flow too. The U.S. Department of Commerce targeted $300 million specifically for coal communities as part of $3 billion available in the American Rescue Plan to invest in different economies to help them recover and improve resiliency. The IWG also identified 25 energy communities with the greatest needs with a focus on these priority areas. The IWG is hosting a series of webinars and how-to workshops to help catalyze local projects and support communities in applying for and securing federal resources. With more to come, the ongoing work of the IWG and local partners will help ensure America's energy workers and their communities rebound in the near term and thrive for generations to come. To learn more about specific funding opportunities or to find out more information on events, or the latest news, please visit energycommunities.gov. Agatha, thank, thank you very much. And I just want to give a quick shout out to our, our technology team making everything so seamless in these days of, of webinars. Uh, it's really great that we can, we can be in many places at once, uh, but we certainly would prefer to be uh, in person on the ground and we will be uh, in, in the very near term. When it comes to Kentucky, uh, you know, as you saw, we identified 25 energy, uh, priority energy communities across the country, uh, and certainly Kentucky is represented. Uh, number two on, on the list in terms of uh, a, a ranking that was developed by taking the total number of jobs related to the coal industry um, as a total fraction of, of the jobs that are in, in a region, and number two in the country is Eastern Kentucky. Uh, number six is is Western Kentucky, and so uh, these communities were identified first to help us guide the logistics of these uh, listening tours and and stakeholder engagements. And uh, it's really about making sure that we are hearing the voices, as Briggs said, listening to you, listening to community leaders, listening to to workers and communities, uh, because we know that there is not one size, not a one size fits all uh, solution. Uh, the solutions in, in the four corners of the you know, Native American regions in the country are not going to be the same as they are in Appalachia uh, and the same in, in uh, Wyoming and, and in Montana. So uh, this is uh, part of our program in the interagency working group is four different work streams. Uh, first, it's certainly the investments, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, second is integration, and it's integration across the federal government. We have 11 agencies to uh, to navigate. And so for us, it's to integrate the programs across uh, the 11 agencies, but also help communities integrate and, and lower the barrier to applications for programs that might touch multiple agencies. The third is to develop policies that uh, are ingrained in the way we do business in the federal government, and also to, again, assist and help communities. And, and then the last one speaking to here uh, is stakeholder engagement because we need to know what your plans are uh, for the communities. And certainly uh, with, as mentioned, the $300 million set aside for coal communities as part of the American Rescue Plan under EDA, those announcements gave us great insight into community plans with applications that spanned the entire country uh, in all 50 states, the applications coming in for the economic revitalization. And so for us, it's starting with the communities that are in most need of support and in most need of uh, even capacity building is one of the big themes that we're seeing, how to build the capacities in communities uh, to access the federal resources. And you see the interplay between stakeholder engagement, learning where communities are, uh, and then net on the next slide, being able to target those investments towards the types of uh, the types of community programs that are necessary. So we know that uh, many of the communities need assistance with building the types of economic redevelopment capacity. 
And we also know that there are a lot of programs, including infrastructure projects like roads, broadband for sure, water and sewer system improvements. We've been having a number of discussions in Kentucky and know that access to clean water is a, is, is a, big, uh, a big priority. And also in terms of local transportation, what we're trying to do is make sure that these communities that have economic transition, economic dislocation, have the tools at their disposal to create the types of um, competitive advantage so that we can drive in uh, private sector investment. And so we're trying to target the federal investment so that it catalyzes private sector investment. And certainly Kentucky's doing a great job. Uh, everything from the, uh, the Ford factory announcement to a booming um, focus on the agritech business. Uh, and so we're here to learn uh, from you and to learn what types of financing and grant programs uh, and even remediation programs uh, can be best leveraged uh, for the economic revitalization. And so if we go to the next slide, we're, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how to upgrade our infrastructure. Our communities certainly deserve access to reliable broadband, uh, clean, good roads, clean water, modern sewer systems, affordable local transportation. There's a, a big need for cleaning up uh, the environmental legacy, and certainly the infrastructure bill has has funds in it for plugging orphan and abandoned wells as well as abandoned mine lands. And so when we do uh, abandoned mine land remediation, that's immediate jobs in the, in the reclamation process, but also when we do it with a, a bend toward entrepreneurship, bringing these uh, facilities, these uh, historic legacy, envir environmental legacies into economic uh, opportunity, uh, and promoting entrepreneurship for communities, that's uh, a, a great lever for us to be able to pull. And then finally, we need to have robust workforce development programs, not just uh, training programs that might uh, you know, train displaced workers uh, to a job that's not there, but the entire package, creating the economic opportunities, developing the workforce programs that help catalyze private investment and also uh, tie into uh, the direction that communities are going. So we go to the next slide. I'm gonna uh, close a little bit with a uh, way to keep in touch with us. Uh, certainly if you've joined us here today, you heard about us somehow. Uh, and so that's that's great. Many of you may may have found us at energycommunities.gov. You can follow us LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook. What's really important is for us to continually hear the feedback from you uh, about stakeholders that we need to need to engage with, about community plans and challenges that you're you're facing in terms of accessing the types of federal resources. Uh, now, certainly the American Rescue Plan, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities. The infrastructure uh, bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was recently passed and signed into law, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, provide all kinds of opportunities uh, for us to make investments in communities around the country. We, the federal government, all of the IWE, IWG agencies are committed to make sure that those investments are done right. That those those investments are are done in a way that we're stewarding taxpayer money, but also leveraging the op opportunities uh, that communities would have in the future. So we need to hear from you. So please sign up for updates and and communicate with us. And that is our call to action. Um, sign up at the website, follow us, attend our webinars and workshops. But also please give us give us feedback because what we need to what we need to know is. Uh, again, what stakeholders to to engage with, what types of investments to target and how we can best help with communities to build capacity uh, to do economic redevelopment programs, as well as creating a one-stop shop for the communities. And then finally, the check mark in blue uh, is about helping to bring together coalitions to identify the types of matching funds. Sometimes federal funds uh, are limited uh, by the way they're appropriated in Congress that we have to have matching funds uh, from the community partners. And so what we want to do is make sure we're bringing together all the right uh, components so that you have the opportunity to have the most successful applications uh, to, the, to the federal funding streams. And so with that, uh, I, I'm really excited to be working uh, uh, with folks in the state of Kentucky. Uh, certainly had lots of engagement uh, across the state with folks in communities and then, and then certainly in the state house and, and the uh, Kentucky Governor uh, Bashir. Uh, we we had an engagement with with Governor Bashir and his his staff uh, earlier. Um, well, it just just about a month ago, I think, uh, at the White House. Uh, lots of good progress. And although he couldn't join us today, we are really excited that he was able to share a visit, uh, share a video with us. 
Um, by the way, background, if, if you're not familiar, Governor Bashir grew up in the Commonwealth's Fayette, Franklin, and Clark counties, graduated from Henry Clay High School. He's the son of Steve and Jane Bashir, uh, the Commonwealth's 61st governor and first lady. He graduated from Vanderbilt University, and, and earning his JD degree from the University of Virginia School of Law, and Governor Bashir worked in an international law, law firm in, in Washington, D.C. Later moving to Kentucky, uh, move, moving home to Kentucky, he continued his legal career and then in 2016 ran for and was elected attorney general uh, where he fought against the opioid epidemic and arrest record numbers of and arrested record numbers of child predators while directing his office to train thousands of Kentuckians on how to recognize, report and prevent child abuse and, and human tra trafficking. So when uh, Attorney General Bashir was sworn in as Kentucky's 63rd governor, his priorities are in education and protecting pensions earned by the hardworking people of Kentucky. And so I'm really excited to have uh, a video welcome uh, from Governor, Governor Andy Bashir. Good morning, and thank you for having me today to discuss revitalizing Kentucky's energy communities. Right now in Kentucky, we are on the cusp of a new era full of opportunity for all our people and for our economy. Since taking office, we've created more than 24,640 full-time jobs for our people through more than $12.7 billion in investment. This year, we have shattered every economic development record in the books for yearly investment totals. And these investments are transforming regional devastation into prime opportunity for revitalization through the development of new industries, educational opportunities, as well as research and development. And one area that's a priority for us are our coal communities. Between 1990 and 2016, coal mining jobs declined by nearly 85% in our eastern Kentucky region. More than 21,000 direct coal mining jobs have been lost, resulting in the elimination of more than 170,000 indirect jobs during that same time period. Through these struggles, Kentucky has become home to 45 of the nation's persistent poverty counties, according to the EDA. These communities have faced decades of struggle. And I see this moment as the time to bring long overdue change. We need to invest in our coal communities so our folks can thrive again and provide for their families. While Kentuckians have proven their resiliency throughout history, being a leader in many industries like coal, agriculture, automotive and aerospace, we must look to the future. We made history in Kentucky through these industries and now we intend to make history once again by turning these hardships into new opportunities. We plan to do this through a number of initiatives, including establishing Kentucky, especially our Eastern Kentucky region, as the agriculture technology capital of the world. We have a committed workforce ready and able to fuel investments coming into the area. They are ready and willing to be retrained to ensure success for all involved because ultimately they are invested in building back the communities they love and so am I. They wanna put food on the tables for their families and they want to make sure their kids are set for success for generations to come in the place they call home. And let me tell you, companies are already seeing the potential of our workforce. In September, we announced the biggest economic development project in our history. Thanks to our partner, partners at Ford and SK Innovation, a nearly $6 billion investment is going to create 5,000 new jobs for Kentuckians, fueling the nation's largest electric vehicle battery plants right here in the Commonwealth. Bill Ford Jr. told me it's the biggest investment in the auto company's history. They're betting their future on us because they see what we see. Kentucky is taking a leadership role in the coming post-COVID economy, that we can get the biggest projects done, that we have a world-class workforce, and we refuse to ever be seen as a flyover state ever again. This administration is committed to continuing to work with the Biden administration, local government agencies, regional and community organizations on infrastructure needs and investments. Through the recent bipartisan infrastructure bill, we're gonna see historic investments in our nation's core infrastructure priorities. Think about roads and bridges, rail, transit, ports, airports, the electric grid, cleaner water and broadband. This bill's a game changer for our Commonwealth and our people because it's gonna fuel job creation 
and it's ultimately going to help our economic momentum be more than, say, three great years, but 30 incredible years for our people. So the need for action is clear. For decades, Eastern Kentucky's infrastructure has suffered from a lack of sustained and focused investment. We have an economy on fire, and we will have now the extra funds to improve infrastructure statewide, from roads to bridges to broadband. There should be no stopping us. Kentucky is resilient, and right now, all eyes are on us. Every boardroom across the country suddenly knows not just where Kentucky is, but what we can do. We've got to seize this momentum. So together, we can revitalize these eastern Kentucky communities and build back stronger and better than ever before. And when we do, we can realize that collective dream that we all share in Kentucky, but is especially felt in eastern Kentucky, that our kids will never have to leave this state or the communities they grew up in because every opportunity is available for them right there. No young adult should ever leave their community because they have to, not because they choose to. This is what makes America great. Our country, great. Our state, great. And ultimately, providing for that next generation is what all us parents truly live for. Thank you very much. So thanks to the whole um, team from Kentucky and the, the governor's office. Uh, really appreciate their their engagement here. I'm really happy to pass it back to to Briggs and and introduce um, our next uh, next phase. We're going to hear some Kentucky voices. We're going to hear uh, and see some uh, stage setting videos. So Briggs, back to you. Hey, thanks, Brian, and thanks to the governor for that uh, awesome scene setting uh, video. Uh, provides uh, some some real motivation and excitement about maybe what could come next. Uh, we have a poll on the screen, and, and this is going to be very helpful um, in terms of uh, we have a federal panel a little bit later in the program, so they can uh, take this feedback and, and think about it a little bit. But also uh, for the IWG itself, uh, long term, this can um, continue to provide input. This is an optional uh, poll, but uh, we would certainly uh, encourage you to participate if you can. Um, a few housekeeping notes before I set the uh, stage here. I do want to just thank our distinguished guests. Um, we have uh, community leaders. We have uh, leaders from the private sector as well as labor organizations. We have elected officials from uh, the local uh, elected officials, community county commissioners, mayors, uh, state government, and finally uh, congressional government. So, uh, congressional uh, leaders. So, so thank you so much for those officials and their staff for participating today. Um, I do want to tee up that we do have some content on the federal panel later about the infrastructure bill, which was mentioned, a huge influx of cash. And then finally, there are four optional breakout sessions, which links have been put into the chat later. Um, so uh, these topics were uh, identified by Kentucky stakeholders as being priorities. And so we've set aside a one hour block uh, really just to convene both federal and non-federal stakeholders to have those conversations uh, and advance those locally driven uh, discussions or project ideas uh, that are focused on Kentucky. So with that, um, why don't we uh, uh, get the voice uh, teed up here or the video teed up and um, should we go ahead and start that? We estimate about $13 billion in direct payroll has been lost out of our service area from 2009 to 2021. The desperation that someone has with losing their job is traumatic anyway, but they don't know how to do anything else. They have this hopelessness that is just haunting. Most of our folks that we employed would be on public assistance. There's no question about it. They either are in a low paying wage job or they weren't working at all. As you see jobs coming back in different industries other than coal, a lot of those folks are working for us. You see that hope come back where there was helplessness before. With me not working at Horizon, I don't think I would be as happy as I am because it's just a joy to me just to come in and just see the clients and just know that they're happy. And I love being able to make a difference in someone's life. I felt like I was just meant to be here. 
Uh, I was a coal miner for five years. A lot of people were laid off from Southeast Kentucky area and through the government, we were granted grants to go back to school or trade school. So we went back to the electrical lineman program. This facility that we're currently in, we moved in in November of 2016. It was a former mining supply company which had shuttered the doors the, the previous year. A lot of employees were from this local community and they had lost their jobs. When we moved in, we've been able to hire many of those back. A lot of people look at Appalachia as a problem to be solved. And it really is an opportunity and that's the message we really need to deliver. All right, so uh, why don't we uh, uh, go ahead and uh, take a look at the, the poll results uh, from earlier. And uh, a lot of folks not responding. So uh, again, these are optional, but encourage you to encourage you to, uh, to participate. Um, uh, looks like uh, there are uh, need additional funding and need support identifying federal um, funding. So, uh, appreciate those that participated, and and again, we're really using this information to guide the discussion for later in the day as well as long term. So, encourage you to participate um, in that. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, get to our panel. We have four esteemed speakers. Uh, they're each going to share a different perspective um, uh, that hopefully is useful for setting the stage and sort of building on the context that's already been established. Uh, to to kick us off here, uh, we have Chris Williams, the Chancellor of the Kentucky. Community and Technical College System, followed by we'll have Peter Hilly of the Mountain Association, President of the Mountain Association. Then we'll have the Executive Director of SOAR, uh, Colby Hall. And then finally, to round it out, we'll have the Executive Director of the Southeast Kentucky Economic Development uh, Group, uh, Brett Travers. So with that, why don't we put uh, Chris Williams on the screen and, and really a hearty welcome, Chancellor, uh, to, to the stage. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today representing the Kentucky Community and Technical College System, or KCTCS. Our network of 16 colleges across the state, over 73 locations, and our robust online offerings serves our coal communities, particularly through in Eastern Kentucky through Big Sandy Community and Technical College, Hazard Community and Technical College, uh, Somerset Community College and Southeast Community and Technical uh, College. And if you just advance the slide, please. We're ready to help our learners and our employers. While in Western Kentucky, Henderson Community College and Madisonville Community College are ready to do the same. Across those 16 colleges, there are 116 programs of study leading to jobs and careers, whether you're bachelor bound and take one of our transfer degrees, or you take one of our 111 programs of study in technical fields. Next slide, please. Our unique mission includes preparing people to go directly to work, sometimes via transfer to university, but most often through credit or non-credit courses leading right to a career. And of course, we offer dual credit classes in high school as well. Learners can earn everything from their GED to a short-term certificate leading right to work to an associate's degree as part of their career path. We also provide training and assessment for new and incumbent workers with our, employee, with our employer partners. Next slide, please. KCTCS's 16 colleges are the largest providers of talent training and preparation in the Commonwealth. A recent Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education Return on Investment Report notes that across all fields, the median annual salaries after eight years in the workforce for certificates, diplomas, and degree holders is higher than those for high school graduates. We know that education pays. And since KCTCS's tuition is around half that of university tuition, this is also an affordable way to enter the workplace. Next slide, please. Over 70% of KCTCS students receive financial aid, often federal Pell Grants, which cover tuition, books, and other costs. The Work Ready Kentucky Scholarship 
is another outstanding way to help turn learners into highly skilled individuals with fewer financial barriers. And this scholarship is also available to those who are employed. It's available for programs of study in advanced manufacturing, allied health, business and information technology, construction and trades, and transportation and logistics programs. I want to thank our state legislators for their support of learners through this great scholarship. Next slide, please. If you know someone, someone in your family, someone in your church or social organization who's looking for a new career or more skills, our colleges do offer short-term certificates in areas that help you take advantage of the skills you may already hold, or they may already hold, including line technician, and you just met one of those students, CDL driver, nurse aide, phlebotomist, and fiber optics, many other fields. You may want a longer term program that provides even more opportunity. Want to change or start a career now? Go to kctcs.edu forward slash find your career or your college's website. Next slide, please. KCTCS offers several apprenticeship and apprenticeship-like programs in partnership with employers. The FAME program in advanced manufacturing is one and is offered at Henderson, Somerset, and Maysville Colleges. This work and learn program has students working 24 more hours per week, going to college two days per week, and graduating in five semesters with an associate's degree. It's actually offered at 12 locations, but those are the three closest to the coal communities. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide, please. Apprenticeships in partnership with local employers are developed at each college and are a great way for individuals to work while they earn. And for employers, we offer a full suite of services to support you and your apprentice and pay for part of their training. Other support may be available through your local workforce innovation board or in partnership with a local union. You know, apprenticeship participation has been directly correlated to employee retention. It's a wonderful way to engage your employees. Next slide, please. All of the Cole Community Colleges offer many programs moving directly to work, and this listing above is only a few of them. I invite you to contact your local college. People in our college, in our coal communities around our colleges often don't want to move away for work. And sometimes the kind of work they're interested in is not located in their community, but can be done remotely. So I suggest that you look at partnerships with Teleworks or take advantage of many other remote work opportunities. Our colleges provide the education needed to work this way, and your Kentucky Career Center may have the lead you need to get a remote work job. Next slide, please. Our KCTCS Workforce Solutions offices at each college work directly with employers on employee assessments, both before and during employment, and in education and training for your incumbent employees and apprentices. After recognizing the impact of COVID-19 on businesses training and development budgets, our colleges have expanded our financial support for companies who upskill their new hires and incumbent workforce. Our trains funding offsets the cost of KCTCS training by up to 75% of the total training costs, allowing your company to increase the depth and breadth of their talent. We thank the General Assembly for that funding that comes annually to support employers in this way. KCTCS trains funding also affords the colleges the opportunity to request seed funding for new industry driven programs. With employer commitment to hire, our colleges can rapidly respond to their local labor market needs and develop in demand training to address real time opportunities. Next slide, please. Your, your college is your partner. It's your partner as lifelong learner in developing your better life and career, but we're also your economic and workforce development partners and so much more. Please don't hesitate to call on the leadership at your college to strengthen your community, to strengthen your region. Next slide, please. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you today. I appreciate the time and look forward to the opportunities for questions and answers. Now it's my pleasure to turn the screen over to Peter Hilly. Good morning and thank you, Chris. 
My name is Peter Hilly, and I'm the president of the Mountain Association, which many of you probably knew for many years as MACID. I'm happy to be speaking to you today from the ancestral lands of the Cherokee and Shawnee people here in Eastern Kentucky. We honor them and all those who came before us. At the Mountain Association, we describe our work in terms of investing in a just transition to a new economy for Eastern Kentucky. We recognize that the new economy needs to be more diverse, more sustainable, more equitable, and more resilient than the old economy was. Go ahead to that next slide. In order to advance the just transition, we need to understand how we got to where we are. This map from the Appalachian Regional Commission shows the communities in red that are economically distressed. That means they fall in the bottom 10% of all the counties in America. And we can see that there's a dense concentration of these counties in Eastern Kentucky. Nearly three quarters of Eastern Kentucky's counties are economically distressed. We know that coal was the dominant industry in this area for a long time, and we know it generated a lot of economic activity. So it makes sense to ask why this region is in such a hard place when we look at poverty rates, unemployment, and per capita income. We know we lost a lot of coal jobs in the collapse of 2012, but this whole area has been characterized by persistent poverty for decades before that. So what happened? Well, coal jobs actually peaked in Kentucky in 1949 with 75,000 coal mining jobs. In 1950, the union signed a deal with the mine operators to allow the mines to be mechanized. And that's when the long decline of jobs began. On this chart, you can see coal production is the upper line and jobs is the lower line. Even as we were producing more coal, we were doing it with fewer workers and bigger machines. We went through boom and bust cycles, job numbers went up and down, but when we look across the last 70 years, we can see that overall jobs have been going down. By 2012, we were down to 20,000 jobs, less than a third of what we had in 1949. But now these were more technical jobs and were much better paying jobs than in the early days of coal mining. Then in 2012, for the first time, natural gas per BTU became cheaper than coal. And that's shown on this graph. And that was due to new fracking technologies for gas. When that happened, the thermal coal industry collapsed and we lost about half of our remaining coal jobs in Eastern Kentucky almost overnight. That decline has continued and even the recent uptick in coal jobs is not going to reverse the long-term trend. We know that the people and places that produced coal literally fueled the growth of our entire nation, but they didn't share in that prosperity. In fact, the old economy made this one of the poorest places in the United States, even before the collapse in 2012. These communities sacrificed. They sacrificed lives, health, water, ecosystems, prosperity, and got little in return. They are owed a debt. And that's why we talk about justice in this economic transition. And that debt can be repaid with the investments that are needed to build a new economy. We know the loss of coal jobs is a very real tragedy for the miners, their families, their communities, but it's a tragedy that sits on top of a disaster. And that disaster is the long-term systemic economic failure in this place where the markets are broken, schools are underfunded, healthcare issues are off the charts, and we have lost so much of our workforce over the years as people left to find jobs somewhere else. In fact, many of our communities have lost more than half of their population since the 1940s. When we understand all of that, we can see that we need to do much more than just replace the jobs that were lost in the recent collapse of the coal industry. We need to help communities recreate themselves as places where people can live and will choose to live. To do this, we need to create local economies that work. It's not about bringing in one big industry to replace another. Frankly, that has never worked here. But we can build strong local economies with locally owned businesses that create jobs, have a reason to exist in this place, and deliver benefits to the people who live here. We can do this by focusing our efforts in, in key sectors like clean energy, local food, tourism, healthcare, the creative economy, sustainable forestry, housing, and by using broadband to connect to national and international markets. These sectors can generate jobs and livelihoods for families and also improve the quality of life. So the farmer's market, the bookstore, the coffee shop, the brew pub, the music venue, the hiking trail, restaurants, health clinics, 
All these are economic drivers that also contribute to quality of life. And that's what we need to rebuild our communities. So that the young person growing up in East Kentucky can see that they have a future here. Those who went off to college or to a first job will want to return. Those who left decades ago to find work and are now ready to retire will see that their old hometown now has the services and amenities they want and need. And the visitor who comes for a craft fair or to go mountain biking or hiking or for a local festival looks around and says, hey, this place is beautiful. Maybe I can make a life here. And we can reimagine our communities to once again be thriving places with a wide range of opportunities for all. That's the future we're working for at the Mountain Association. We provide startup capital and expansion loans to small businesses, along with training and technical assistance to help them succeed. We invest in clean energy, specifically energy efficiency and solar for small businesses and nonprofits, a sector that has enormous potential for growth. In fact, we've invested millions of dollars in energy projects over the last several years and are saving these businesses hundreds of thousands of dollars every year on their utility bills. We help people and communities connect to share ideas, and we work with local leaders to help them build the future they want. We do this with an extensive network of partners and allies because a heavy lift takes all hands. And we're seeing examples all over East Kentucky of how the new economy can work. We're delighted to be working with the IWG to ensure the rollout of these new federal resources is directed in ways that will bring the maximum benefit to these communities and is invested in ways that will grow the good work that is already being done. We need to bring everyone along to advance the just transition. Thank you. And now I'll pass it along to Colby Hall from SOAR. Hey, good morning. And thanks, Peter, for that uh, introduction. Uh, as Peter said, my name is Colby Hall, and I am the executive director of SOAR which stands for Shaping Our Appalachian Region. Uh, we are a regional nonpartisan and, and nonprofit focused um, on the 54 counties, uh, Appalachian Regional Commission counties in, in Eastern Kentucky, um, and really have, a, uh, have an interest in how we fill those economic gaps that were left by the uh, downturn of the coal economy. Uh, SOAR does this primarily through connecting and convening communities across the region. Our work is guided by a strategic seven pillar blueprint that was forged from listening sessions with stake, stakeholders um, uh, in, in listening sessions all across Eastern Kentucky. Uh, it's, it's, it's the number one uh, blueprint pillar that I wanna talk a little bit about today, and that's connectivity. Uh, connectivity and broadband specifically. Um, when, when you when you hear about broadband or when you read up about broadband and connectivity, typically a lot of folks kind of um, segment the discussion into in kind of three arenas. The first arena is access or accessibility. Uh, the second phase is affordability. And the third phase is adaptability or the digital equity, digital literacy component. It, it's that first piece, the accessibility uh, that I want to talk about today, as many communities in Eastern Kentucky uh, and all across the Appalachian region are, are seeking to answer and, and solve that first uh, uh, phase um, currently. Um, last mile broadband in regions like Eastern Kentucky is, is hard. Um, it's, it's time consuming and it's prohibitively expensive. There's just no other way around it. So I do want to set the right expectations for why this, this work hasn't already gotten done. Um, but I'm gonna skip talking about how important it is because if, if, if we've learned anything from this pandemic that we're still going through and coming out of, it's that rural connectivity is, is it's life or death. It's as important as, as any other infrastructure pillar out there. Um, as most on this call know, the problem with, with rural broadband is that it's a market failure. Right, which means that there's a demand for a local good or service that the private sector can't provide on its own. Um, the ROI, it's just not large enough and it can't be obtained quickly enough. So what that means is without public assistance, uh, it, the job won't, won't get done, it won't happen. Uh, most folks here probably understand the history of rural electrification and, and rural telephony. 
uh, without the um, REA and, and our now electric and, and telephone co-ops, uh, electricity um, and telephony uh, would have been severely delayed uh, coming to rural communities across Eastern Kentucky and rural communities across the country. Um, we're in a very similar situation with broadband today. Um, the good news is, is that we're in the golden age of, of broadband funding. Um, the recently passed federal infrastructure bill allocated 65 billion in broadband funding, the, the, the bulk of, I believe, 42.5 or around 42 bill, billion that's gonna be distributed directly to states. And every state is gonna get uh, at least 100 million. There's also some additional money in there for some middle mile projects, digital equity, um, there's also some additional money for the USDA reconnect program. So that money's coming down the pipeline um, from the state of Kentucky standpoint, the Commonwealth standpoint, we should be seeing um, the rest of um, uh, the, the 250 million pot that was passed um, last General Assembly session. We should have 200 million that's released this General Assembly. So that's immediate. And then on the 24th of this month, the USDA um, opened up applications for its most recent reconnect program, which is gonna allocate 1.15 billion to eligible communities across um, across the country uh, with loans, grants, and a combination of two. So the, the the money is there, right? Which is which is important, don't get me wrong. But if you hear me say one thing on this presentation or this speech or, or this conversation today, Hear me out on this because this is probably the most important thing or the most important point I want to make with my time today. Money alone isn't going to solve the digital divide in, in regions like Eastern Kentucky. Money alone is not going to get the job done. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, going back over 10 years now, like around 2009, there's been six billion in federal subsidies that have been dedicated to high cost areas like those we find in rural Eastern Kentucky, but still the, the rural urban digital divide ha, has, has grown, right? So really the more important question that we have to ask as economic development organizations, as community development organizations, as, as higher ed institutions, everybody that's on this call today that has a stake in seeing the region return to prosperity, when it comes to broadband, the most powerful question to ask is, now that we have sufficient funding to, if not get this job done, but take a massive chunk out of it, how do we make sure it gets to the right areas with the right providers, right? How do we make sure that that money gets allocated to where it's truly needed? That is the most important question to ask. And so I just wanna give six simple steps for communities to consider or, or community leaders to consider to prepare themselves to receive broadband funding. In my work in Eastern Kentucky at SOAR, the part that's um, not been surprising, but it's, an important, it's important, an important point to make is that it wouldn't matter if there was $10 trillion or $10 allocated for, for new broadband projects. Many communities aren't ready to receive a dollar because there's work that has to be done to put yourself in a position to be competitive for these funds. So it's that act point I wanna make on and, and expound a little bit on today through six simple steps that every community or county should take to prepare to receive funding. Step one is to form a fiber board. The, the fiber board, which is often just an offshoot of a county fiscal court or a county government, is your, they're your local digital champions. These are the folks that are a cross section of your community that come together and lay the digital vision for your community. And without them, you have no skin in the game to think about what speeds are necessary, what technology do you want? These are your, your people that are gonna drive these projects forward day in and day out so that the work doesn't fall on the shoulders of just one person. That fiber board is super, super important to get established. Number two is to complete a feasibility study quantitative over qualitative. Anecdotally, we can point to what neighborhoods and areas in our counties do not have functional high-speed internet, right? But that's not good enough on most applications. You've gotta have quantitative data that points to the need. And that can come from a feasibility, a feasibility study that gives you that data that equips you to go after broadband money and be in a position to win. 
That's step number two. Number three is to prioritize projects. So once you've formed your fiber board and you've done some basic mapping and you've completed a feasibility, uh, feasibility study, you've got to start to divide your city or your county up in project slices um, without having a list of priorities. Listen, I wish we could flip a switch and we had everything done tomorrow once we had the money, but it's not going to work like that because these projects take time, especially when we're laying fiber. So you've got to be able to look at your county and slice and dice it into your projects that, that need to get done and then go and get work your way down the list based on the priorities. And again, the fiber board's important because they can help set those priorities, right, for your community. Number four is to quantify costs, right? You, you've got to know how much money you want to go after before you go after. So when you, when you have your county split up into project pieces, you've got to be able to quantify what each project's going to cost so you know which pot of money to attack. Um, number five is, is, is partnerships, explore partnerships. Um, localism is the most important key here when it comes to rural broadband projects. Local governments, local fiber boards, it's local people really driving home this issue for their community. That's, that's how this job gets done. You know, local governments themselves, they may not be, they may not be able to build a new network themselves, but they can definitely look at how they partner with local providers to help make the job easier. Things like public right-of-ways, public easements, uh, free access to uh, government buildings and facilities and water towers. All that stuff matters when it comes to a provider that's looking to build out anything that can help them save time and money and make the job easier is gonna be something that makes your community attractive for them to come into. So you have to, you have to explore those partnerships. And then the last thing is, is applying for funding. Once you have the groundwork laid, you can uh, apply for funding and, and go after those, those funds. So uh, just in conclusion, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, I love talking about broadband and how we as a region can get this job done. I hope some of that information was helpful. And the last thing I'll mention again is money alone isn't gonna solve this problem. Having a strong, local, engaged, local component that's driving the initiative forward um, is going to be a, a, as important as, as the money when it comes to getting broad, broadband projects done in Eastern Kentucky. So that's all I had, and I guess I will turn it over to Mr. Uh, Brett Traver, the Executive Director for SCED, the Southeast Kentucky Economic Development Organization. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thank you, Agatha, for allowing me to share the screen real quick. I'll get my slides up. It's a great to be here. Thank you all. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, like Colby said, I'm Brett Traver. I'm the executive director of the Southeast Kentucky Economic Development Corporation. Um, there is no silver bullet. Uh, for Appalachia or to keep any region growing or revitalizing a region. I always like to look at it, it's more like a silver shotgun shell with a lot of pellets tackling community, workforce, and economic development. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the pellets that spread that, that SCED brings to this work. So um, we're a, a certified development financial institution of treasury uh, program with more than $25 million worth of assets here in the region. This includes an intermodal rail park uh, here in the Somerset area that serves about two dozen businesses, including some of the region's larger employers. Uh, that was a $7 million investment uh, made about 15 years ago. that keeps paying benefits. Um, here you can see some of the impact since our founding. Uh, there aren't many areas we haven't touched in this 45 county service territory. Uh, our current loan portfolio is just over $15 million, $14 million with a couple of million dollars in the pipeline at any given time. Uh, you see our technical assistance hours. So just over the past two years, our staff has provided uh, 8,000 hours of counseling uh, to businesses, both startup and existing small, medium and large. Uh, throughout the region. Uh, so we get a lot done for uh, a staff of eight people. Uh, just over uh, 
past 22 months, uh, our, our COVID period, uh, some of the things that we've done, uh, the $42 million in micro loans, uh, or 42 micro loans for just over a million dollars. Those are those projects that Peter talked about earlier. Uh, those those brew pubs and pizzerias, and, uh, retail places that, that make a community, a community and a community that people want to uh, spend time in. Uh, a lot larger dollar volume, uh, but, but smaller uh, number of loans, uh, 5.7 million. Those are our larger projects are. Our backbone type of projects, like the the person you see there welding, that's at Logan Corporation. You saw uh, a bit of that video earlier, and I'll talk a little bit about them next. Um, and four hundred and sixteen jobs created uh, through that time. Those are in in everything from those retail type of positions and tourism to to base manufacturing jobs that. Uh, really bring the multiplier effect to the community. Um, but, you know, those lo those loans to businesses are are great. Um, we really like to see the impact it has on individuals. Uh, there in the past two fiscal years, uh, between our lending, technical assistance and programming uh, with our partners at Danish Kentucky Alliance, our manufacturing extension program here in Kentucky, uh, we've impacted more than 1,800 individuals within those businesses. Uh, what's amazing for our region is that 1,100 of those uh, would be categorized as low-income individuals. Uh, the median household income in our region is $36,000, uh, 43% below the national average. Nearly every company we work with, I'm sure Peter sees it the same way, touches someone in a low income household. Uh, it's a long standing problem. It's not new. Uh, and what, what uh, Colby just said, money alone isn't the answer. It's, it's just the hard work and creating opportunities. And and I just like for our companies uh, to tell their story. You know, Kyle uh, Cox at Logan Corporation. Uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, more than fifty percent of our loan portfolio by dollar volume is to manufacturers like Logan Corporation. And they've been a long-term client of ours. Most of ours, many of ours, are uh, with our first loan to them in twenty sixteen. Uh, when I first met them, we, they were expanding from, from one location in our region to, to move into Salyersville, Kentucky, into a larger building that, that, uh, that you got to see a little bit of in that video earlier. Uh, they had 30 employees at the time. Uh, they now have more than 100 employees. And our latest partnership with Logan uh, the Office of Community Services within Health and Human Services has enabled us to do more work in partnership with East Kentucky Concentrated Employment Program. I hope those folks are on here uh, to provide more services directly to the workers to help those workers access programming throughout the, the community. Uh, and, and I would suggest if you got a minute, uh, well, seven and a half minutes exactly. You can follow that link to uh, see the full video about the work going on there, what it's done for, for Salyersville, Kentucky. Uh, this works directly with our mission because manufacturing, metalworking fits with the skill sets of many of the people in the region. Uh, you saw that conversation earlier in, with KCTCS and the top of people there they're putting out and the type of skills that are people that have worked in those those uh, jobs in the, in the past and the manufacturing uh, has a good economic impact multiplier uh, for for the region um, we put a lot of federal money uh, to use over the past few years uh, I just thought I'd throw this up there uh, 
uh, for our federal partners that are on this. Uh, and, and Peter and, and everybody has a similar list, I'm sure. Uh, more than 6.8 million in grant and borrowed funds in a couple years. Uh, some for operations, some for some contractual work, but the bulk of that is to lending. And it's not all grants. We borrow uh, not a small amount of money, uh, just over 1.8 million to relend into the region. Uh, so that's more than $4 million uh, through federal programs that we've been able to leverage into projects throughout the region. Uh, of these lending funds, uh, just real quickly, our friends from Treasury and EDA, we thank you. We've got that 1.1 million out in about uh, a year. Uh, the another Treasury program, CDFI, the Rapid Response Program. I know Peter and our other CDFIs here in the region. We we were grateful for those funds, and we've been able to put. We'll we'll have that uh, money out into the region uh, before the end of this year as well. Um, so it's been a, you know, I'm, I'm standing between Q and A, and if you can't tell by how I'm uh, putting this out there, I'd much rather take questions than, than you all hear me rattle on. But again, SCED is just one tool uh, to work within the area, but it takes many, many partners. You heard Colby talk about that. Uh, I like to look at this work as a community or a region sitting on that three-legged stool of community workforce and economic development with professionals focused on all three of those areas they're distinct they're interrelated but they're distinct and uh, bringing a focus to those three things be it if you're in manchester kentucky or you're sked in 45 counties uh, Mountain Association and SOAR in 54, or your uh, Kentucky's Department of Local Government trying to raise the entire state. If we if we work on these three key areas in a holistic way, uh, there's nothing we can't do, and along with providing the type of information and resources that our businesses need. Uh, we help our businesses grow and prosper. They provide the work. And there's nothing that a good job and people working and contributing to their communities that we can't uh, accomplish. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, Briggs. As soon as I see how to stop sharing this screen, my contact information is there. Uh, I answer that phone number if you call it. I uh, would love to hear from folks and, and how we work together to move the region forward. Uh, Briggs, I'll turn it back over to you. Hey, that's great, Brett. And I'll ask all of our uh, uh, panelists to uh, rejoin me on the screen. Uh, thank you for those uh, those formal remarks. And now we're in the Q and A session of our of our uh, agenda. And and we have a little bit of time. Um, I'll I'll say what I've been saying in the chat. Please do put your uh, your thoughts in the chat if you have questions in particular for the panelists. And we've got a few here. Um, then I'll ask those of the panelists and ask them to respond. But but also, even if you just have a comment yourself, um, you know, due to time, we were only able to put a handful of voices on the panel, but we fully recognize that there could be diverse perspectives, both from organization type, background, or geographic uh, association. And so, you know, we really like to have you be part of this conversation as well. So please do drop that into the chat. So, um, with that being said, um, I want to ask my uh, first question actually uh, to Peter Hilly. Um, you talked a little bit about creating local economies that quote work, um, and you know through uh, EDA's funding for coal communities, through a lot of the new uh, funding that's coming through for the infrastructure bill. You know, there's a lot of funding available, and I guess it's a, it's sort of an open question. Like, well, you know. How, how do you actually create something that's thoughtful uh, and purposeful and locally driven, um, you know, as that as that funding comes through? Sure. And thanks for that question, Briggs. You know, when we think about local economies that work, we got to think about what makes things viable for people. And one thing we all like to do is eat. We did a lot of that last week, I'm sure. And one of the sectors that we've invested heavily in is local foods. For example, in Salyersville, 
we supported the expansion of the IGA grocery store there, which now has a produce section that's six times as big as it was in their previous store. Now you think about what that means. The first thing it means is anybody in that community now has better, easier access to healthy food. So it's not just a local foods outcome, it's also a health outcome that results. And if you think about trying to recruit a new doctor to come and, and work in a local medical facility there, one of the things they're probably wanna, gonna wanna know is, well, I have to drive two hours to get the food that I'd like to have. And when they see it available there in a local store, it makes a difference for somebody thinking about making a life in that community. One of the things that makes that grocery store work and work better is that when they did this expansion, they also did a complete overhaul of the energy components and grocery stores are very high energy users because you've got all the coolers and you've got the HVAC system and these could be working against each other. The coolers are trying to keep the food warm while you're trying to keep the, keep the food cool while you're trying to keep the store warm. And those systems can be integrated in ways that save literally tens of thousands of dollars a year just through efficiencies in reconfiguring those systems. Now they're looking at putting solar on the roof. A very similar story down in Letcher County in Ison, Kentucky, where the IGA has done a complete energy retrofit and now also added solar to the roof of that store. And that reduces energy costs in a way that helped keep the doors open in these uh, institutions that are really key pillars uh, for the survivability of the community. We see it in the healthcare sector in Rockcastle County, where decades ago they developed a specialization in long-term respiratory care and do it better than anybody else in the state. As a result, that hospital is growing instead of shrinking and dying. Or we can look at Pikeville, where the combination of higher education at UPike and healthcare are driving a new economy there uh, that's making one of the former capitals of the coal industry, a, a real thriving uh, bright point in the economy of Eastern Kentucky. So we got to think about making economies work for people. And we do that by localizing those economies. Uh, that's, that's very helpful. Thanks for providing that additional context and, and, and those uh, examples. Um, Brett, I want to talk, uh, just continue this thread on economic development. You, you know, that, that's your bread and butter, uh, economic development. Uh, so why don't you just talk to us a little bit more about that? And I thought maybe something the, the viewers might be interested in. Uh, you mentioned a track record of working with federal agencies to get funding. That's, you know, one of the reasons why we're all here today. Um, so maybe if you could demystify that and talk a little bit about sort of um, building on Peter's uh, comments there. How, how do we get economic development going uh, in a region? Uh, local leadership. Uh, all economic development is local. Uh, I'm a regional organization. I come from the state economic development cabinet. Uh, I used to joke, I joke that I didn't know people did this for a living 21 years ago when I left the Army as an NCO. Uh, but local leadership, putting the resources where they're needed and that with the infrastructure, the workforce and the community, and, uh, and then a person focused on those things, uh, be it helping your local businesses grow, be it be it attraction. I, I agree with Peter. There's not one industry that, that's going to turn the region around, but if we can bring new investment into the region, uh, wherever it comes from, somebody wants to invest $10 million in SCED territory and put 100 people to work, I am all for it. Uh, and I think we can do it and we can do that well as uh, so to your question about, you know, finding those federal resources and things of that nature, I, I refer to it as the alphabet soup federal programs, you know, our usual suspects. We have great partners in, at Treasury uh, when we became a CDFI what, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, we started with USDA. Our friends uh, Scott Moss will be on her later uh, at USDA. You know, we. We recently, last year, we borrowed a million dollars from them and in their inter, intermediary relending program. And we're matching that with a quarter of a million dollars of our own money. Uh, and we've got an application in for a, for a, for what will be our fifth IRP. Uh, and we just we just put that to work in uh, businesses, kind of large and small, uh, that are going to create jobs for people, uh, both. For the skills that they have, you know, that's one of the things, you know, Logan Corporation was a good fit uh, there in Salyersville because 
those miners leave with a wealth of, of metal fabrication, welding, teamwork, that type of workforce fits really well for what they do and, and what they've been able to do there. That company, 117-year-old 100, company, focused on mining in the industry. Just a few years ago, 100% of their work was in the mining industry. Making those dump truck beds in Sayersville, Kentucky is 75% of their business and growing now. Uh, it makes over 600 a year. Um, so that was kind of a rambling answer, I guess, to, to say that economic development is local. Good local leadership makes it happen. Good partnerships with folks in our KCTCS and our workforce development folks, uh, knowing who those resources are and how to bring those to bear. Uh, so you can solve problems. That's what I like to say we do in the CDFI economic development realm is we help solve problems for our clients, whether it is the the two person sign company uh, down the street from us to uh, an automotive uh, uh, supplier with 300 employees. We help them solve problems and know where those resources are. And I think everybody locally should. Brett, that, that's great. And that actually reminds me of a comment that we heard in our 101 webinar we did a couple of weeks ago, which was local leadership is just really critical. Um, and I want to pivot uh, to Chancellor Williams. Uh, one thing that you said in your uh, remarks was, you know, we, we don't just uh, teach you, uh, but we also do economic development. And so our first two speakers just responded to my comment there. And then I wondered if you could maybe just share a few a few thoughts on economic development and how your community college system can participate. And then we also got a question in the chat, which was just looking for a little bit more detail of the college location name specifically near coal communities. And if you could share a little bit more on your apprenticeships offerings. Sure. So I posted, uh, I'm going to go backwards here. I posted the colleges in the chat along with the link to the colleges. Each college does have an apprenticeship coordinator in their workforce solutions area. And uh, that's a great way to get to them. Just call the main number and ask for workforce solutions and talk with the folks there. In terms of economic development, to bring in new companies to help retain current companies or help current companies expand, you have to have a skilled workforce. And so KCTCS, our 16 colleges together, we share our curriculum, we share our resources. And so uh, other colleges may have a program, for example, that needs to come into a new area. When App Harvest moved into the Maysville area, um, we were able to bring in partners for Maysville Community and Technical College that uh, then had knowledge to work with App Harvest, for example, or uh, a new welding company comes in and we help uh, our, our local colleges with the resources to support that if they don't have that particular kind of welding. So not only do we have funds available, but we have a lot of expertise across the state that we can draw on as a network of these 16 colleges. So, for example, as part of the Ford SK deal that folks keep mentioning, um, Elizabeth Community, Elizabethtown Community and Technical College and Jefferson Community and Technical College has both stepped up to the plate, particularly E-Town, since the site is so near to them. And we're able to really talk about the kinds of programs they could make available, the kinds of training support dollars that we have, the kinds of equipment we could bring in to train uh, potential workers on. And that's a you know very early partnership, and down the road we'll understand better what those training needs are. But it's that kind of one-to-one -one community to engagement partnership that we love, and that our colleges should be exhibiting in every community. That desire to be at the table with new expanding companies, companies you're trying to retain, and and really being part of the conversation and providing resources. Thank you for that, Chancellor. Um, Colby, uh, to round out our economic development discussion, you know, you talked about your blueprint up front and broadband, you hit on that pretty much the entire time. We know that's a, a foundational and catalytic investment and particularly relevant <clears throat> given the 60 or so billion dollars in the IIJA. Uh, so we'll hear a little bit more about that later on the federal panel, but thank you for all of that. Um, but maybe do you want to talk a little bit about economic development or perhaps some of the other pillars in your blueprint? 
Yeah, absolutely, uh, Briggs. I, I would say economic development from source standpoint or, or from the vision that I have for source standpoint, I always tie it back to population loss. And um, Peter shared some slides as you look at the downturn of, of coal. But when you look at Eastern Kentucky, we, we shed another uh, 5% uh, when you look at the 2010 census to the 2020 census. So, you know, you have to have people for, for everything, right? And if we don't find a way to, 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 to reverse those population outflows, everything's going to be a lot more challenging in, in our region. So uh, when we when we look at, you know, population outflows, right, you, you solve that two ways. Either you bring new people in or or and or hopefully both, you retain more of your own domestic talent that would have left, right? And so we see a real opportunity in remote work, right? And we really see remote work being a viable economic development strategy, which is why I hit on broadband so much because that's about the only thing that can limit the viability of remote work opportunities. So uh, just kind of briefly, I'll, I'll say, um, we have a massive opportunity coming out of this pandemic as workers are more flexible and able to um, uh, do most white collar jobs wherever they want to or, or more or more so than at any other point in, 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 in history work wherever they want to. Eastern Kentucky can be a destination for those external workers, but we can also offer those same opportunities to people from the region to give them the chance to no longer have to leave, but only leave if they choose to leave, as, as Governor Bashir said. So economic development for us, that's the one kind of piece of it. I know it's more than that, and everybody else talked about that, but we have a real opportunity because most of those jobs, Briggs, they're already created. Just spend some time on LinkedIn and, and look at any high-tech company. Those jobs are as available to, to somebody from Eastern Kentucky as anybody else across the country. We just got to figure out how we can place more of our of our students coming out of whether it's KCTCS or any of the other post secondary institutions across the region, or how they fill those good paying, uh, often high tech jobs that are able to be done remotely. Um, a couple of other blueprint pillars, though, I'll, I'll mention real quick breaks that highlight some of our partnerships with federal and state agencies. I saw Guy Land was in the, the participants chat. I, I think Mrs. Mansion uh, Gail is set to talk next uh, for somebody from the Appalachian Regional Commission, but they are our primary public partner. They are sees a, a wonderful organization that supports source work in so many different areas. So it's hard to pinpoint them down to a specific pillar plan. They did just fund us for a $50,000 power planning grant that we're working with an, a local electric co-op of. So we're so supportive and appreciative of ARC's work with SOAR. Um, the last one I'll mention is uh, entrepreneurship and a digital economy, which is pillar number three. Uh, we have a great relationship with the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development as the innovation hub for 42 Eastern Kentucky counties. Um, primarily, we have um, we provide technical assistance staffing uh, for any uh, small business or, or entrepreneur that has a, a high growth opportunity to to scale and to create jobs and, and to make investments in Eastern Kentucky. We work very closely with our technical assistance providers like the Mountain Association and like SCED where we do referrals um, to organizations like them, uh, to private sector partners that do uh, digital marketing, um, different things like that that are needed by local businesses to try to circulate and keep that money local. Um, we just try to make sure that if there's an entrepreneur or a small business owner or an aspiring entrepreneur or small business owner, that they can come to us and we can kind of point them in the right direction and make sure that they don't fall in the cracks. So. Uh, between the cabinet and, and the ARC, those are two of, of the main uh, public partners that are really critical to SOAR being able to do the work that it does. Hey, that, that's great. And, and thank you all for that round of questions on, on economic development. Um, you know, we need the fundamental infrastructure and the quality of life. We've got to have the jobs um, and no point in training people for jobs that don't exist. But it sounds like from some comments Colby said and, and others that Sounds like uh, there are a lot of jobs that are available and hopefully even more will grow uh, with this, particularly this infusion of cash from the federal government. But uh, but but you got to have the private sector and you have to have labor organizations. And I want to talk a little bit about workers and in and, and their role in that. We've talked about communities here. Um, let's talk a little bit about workers. And so my first question is going to come back to you, Peter, and I want to talk a little bit about sort of the dynamic you talked about um, people in communities and how there's uh, been persistent poverty and sort of that backdrop. 
And, and then Colby, I think you were kind of hitting at sort of an angle around remote work and, and labor force participation and, and outflow. So Peter, I wonder if maybe you could sort of give us a, a little bit more building on your formal remarks of sort of the landscape and that dynamic of, of workers rejoining the workforce or, or maybe transitioning from um, just, just interested in your thoughts there. Sure. Thanks, Briggs. Um, you know, one of the things that we have observed is that our economic challenges in Eastern Kentucky are, are directly connected to our demographic challenges because when workers have lost jobs in this region, and I don't mean just recently, I mean for decades, what they've typically done is left to go find work somewhere else. These are these are hardworking people, and they've got, uh, in many cases, a truck payment due like you or I would. And well, in the period from around 2012 to 2000 or 2010 to 2018, they lost around 1,500 coal jobs and they lost around 2,500 in population. Now that sounds to me like 1,500 miners and their families who left to find work elsewhere. So if we just focus on how do we create jobs to put miners back to work, we don't take into account whether those miners are even still there in the community, we're kind of missing the boat. We really have to look at how we recreate these communities as places where people can live. And that means not just creating jobs, but creating that whole entrepreneurial ecosystem and the economic ecosystem and, and focusing on some of those drivers like education and healthcare that provide durable jobs. You know, we've had more jobs in healthcare in Eastern Kentucky for a long time than we've had in the coal industry. So we can grow those sectors. And as we do that, when we strengthen a healthcare facility in a community, let's talk about Rock Castle Regional uh, Medical Center there in Mount Vernon. You know, that that has continued to grow, to add beds, to add doctors, it adds jobs, but it also means that those critical services are available in the community. And so that healthcare dollar gets spent locally. And when a dollar gets spent locally, on average, it will circulate seven times in that local economy before it passes out. So we got to think about how to relocalize that spending and also ask who owns the business. Because if you spend that dollar at Walmart, it doesn't tend to recirculate in the same way. It's, it kind of heads straight to Arkansas. So uh, we've got to strengthen those local businesses. And as I said earlier, in those sectors that can not only generate economic activity, but also have a reason to exist in this place and generate benefits for the community. You know, I mentioned sustainable forestry and the University of Kentucky said that sustainable forestry could be a $7 billion a year industry in Eastern Kentucky. Now that depends on doing it right. You know, we, we can't just go in and, um, and and take everything out of these forests. We've got to manage them in ways that actually can improve the forest while we appropriately harvest the timber and then use those materials locally to upscale and create secondary products um, like Powell Valley Millworks does in uh, up in Powell County. You know, they they have a, a fantastic facility there. They're using local wood. They're turning it into high quality products. They've got over 200 employees and they sell those products all over the country. So it's a great example of how we can uh, maximize the benefit from the resources that we have rather than just extracting the resources to get the first dollar and have the profits from that go to outside investors. Uh Th thanks for that. And you identified a few sectors there. I wanted to turn to, to Brett and talk a little bit about sectors and, and sort of the workforce, uh, the worker dynamic a little bit more. Um, sort of what have you seen working well and, and perhaps what industry sectors are you seeing um, creating good, uh, good, you know, well-paying, uh, family-sustaining kind of wages or benefits? Um, you know, what, what, what things are working right in terms of workforce training? Wow, uh, that's a that's a big question. Um, I think with uh, workforce training is is folks coming with the the soft skills as well as the hard skills uh, that that they get with with Chancellor Williams at KCTCS coming with the uh, you know willingness to show up on time, uh, prepared to work, uh, bringing those soft skills to the table, being able to work in a team and things of that nature. And I know all, all educational institutions are working to provide that, uh, you know, uh, 
Peter talks about the sustainable forestry. You know, there's been, you know, just trying to just a quick math between Powell Valley Millworks, Independence Stave, and Round County. Uh, you know, probably in just the past few years, a couple of hundred million, you know, getting up to around $150 million worth of investment uh, and several hundred jobs in, in that and others. Uh, you know, Independence Stave is making barrels and uh, now we'll be making barrels, in, uh, bourbon barrels in Moorhead, Kentucky. So Kentucky signature industry, and that's a $66 million investment in around 250 jobs across the street from a hundred million dollar investment by App Harvest uh, in 500 jobs. So uh, workforce participation, I think is one of the biggest things we need to, to work on. Uh, Kentucky's historically low in workforce participation, and our region is historically lower than than the state. Uh, and I don't think it's because these folks aren't working. Uh, they're working in an economy that, that, that it's a cash economy. You know, they 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 have have a, have a system that works for them that uh, pays the bills, and uh, the you know. The, there, there's nobody starving in, in Eastern Kentucky, uh, or very few. I mean, I'd say nobody, but there's people that are working in the cash economy while also working with the federal government systems that are there to, to help support them. Uh, so how do we bring them off of that cash economy into a tax paying W-2 type of pay? And that's uh, with, with more and better job opportunities. Uh, working with the private sector, uh, bringing people uh, that have had substance abuse disorder issues, uh, incarceration issues, uh, all of the, those things. Uh, when, when I say it's a silver shotgun shell, that's what I mean. Is that there's there's no one entity that, that can tackle all of these. Uh, so uh, that's why I try to break it down into those three areas. Focus on what we do uh, in our organization. And and just uh, try to beat the drum that everybody uh, works on those issues professionally, day in and day out. Uh, just keep chopping the wood. So I would say, you know, KCTCS is doing the right right things. Uh, they certainly are. I've got great partnerships uh, with. Uh, before I left Moorhead, uh, I was a local economic development there. Worked with. Uh, KCTCS to put their new state-of-the-art campus there in the, the regional industrial park in Round County. Uh, call on KCTCS for uh, apprenticeships, uh, working with one of our companies uh, in in London. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name of Highlands Diversified Services. Uh, I've got Dr. Dr. Linden's on my board. Uh, Chancellor, as well as Elisa Johnson here at Somerset Community College, so we're working together, and I think those are those are the keys. Uh, that 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 clear communication between partners and the partners working with what they know how to do. I, I don't need to try to teach somebody uh, welding. I, I'll leave that to KCTCS for for that. Uh, so, Brett, that's great. Thank you so much, and. Uh, Chancellor Williams, you, you, KCTCS was just mentioned probably a dozen times in the last few uh, comments. Um, I wondered if maybe you could share um, uh, some observations and, and perhaps um, in addition to maybe success stories or industries that you see a lot of activity in, maybe also what needs to be improved from your point of view. We have a lot of distinguished guests in the audience from the federal and state level. Um, you know, be interested in your thoughts there. Thank you. I've, I've had the pleasure of serving at both Hazard Community and Technical College and Henderson Community College, both in coal communities and um, agree that, you know, there's there's always opportunity, um, not only financially, but also in terms of, I think, um, just this isn't going to come out right, maybe, but believing in oneself. Everybody in those communities is so smart and so innovative and so entrepreneurial and so ready to move forward and yet 
collectively we're not moving forward as much as we'd like to. And I am grateful for our colleges and our college leadership and our partners who are part of that process because there's there's extraordinary there are extraordinary communities. Uh, that said, you know, I think uh, the more resources that we can bring to bear and the more uh, specialized training and partnerships like South uh, Southeast Kentucky, for example, has a great partnership around the recovery community and looking at how people coming out of recovery or in, in recovery can get training that links them directly to jobs. So they just featured a student who was a, a coal miner and is now, I believe, a respiratory therapist, for example. Our medical facilities need lots of help at all sorts of various levels from a, a person at, you know, a, that's a phlebotomist drawing blood, which does not take very much training to that registered nurse right there at the bedside who after two years of study is, is ready to be a nurse and, and be an integral part of the healthcare team. I think there's lots of opportunity in allied health. There's going to be lots of opportunity in fiber optics and in laying, you know, that broadband that we want as the infrastructure bill moves forward, the construction opportunities and others. I think there's just there's just an extraordinary amount of opportunity and some of it is uh, lifting that up to the people in the communities that here's an opportunity and here are the ways we can keep you engaged in your own community so you're not leaving. So those resources are staying at home and being part of um, a really strong and vibrant tradition in those communities. Kobe, I want to uh, give you the last word on the panel here, bringing it all together. I think as the chancellor just said, uh, she really reiterated a lot of the points that you made specifically on broadband, such as having a game plan, having your partnerships lined up. Um, and we know that a lot has to come together, particularly in communities that maybe don't have a lot of capacity, uh, you know, can't write the grant necessarily for themselves or don't have the cost share to put up on a project. Uh, a lot of challenges right there. And, and so I um, want to just give you an opportunity to reflect on this conversation a little bit. Any, anything you'd like to share? Well, nobody's got broad enough shoulders to put all of Eastern Kentucky on it to get the job done, right? I mean, it, it, it can't fall on any <laughs> any any one of us. So, um, you know, I'll say this, Briggs, as I reflected, I just crossed my, my year anniversary at SOAR, and um, it's given me a whole new lens to look through local leadership and the importance of local involvement. And uh, you always hear local government's the most important layer of government, but it really is true because um, it, it's those people in, in, in courthouses and in, in city halls that they're, they're, they're the engine for the community. But if we look at even mayors and county judges to be the only people that are doing this work and we put all the responsibility on them, it's too much for them. So I guess I would answer that question, Briggs, with no matter who you are in a community, if you're a you know a business owner or just an employee or you work for government or you work for a nonprofit, or your concerned citizen, everybody's got a part of the rope to pull. Now, I couldn't point it out and tell you what that part is, but just get involved somewhere. There's somebody that needs you. There, there, there's, there's, there's some way to utilize your unique strengths or, or passion. And it doesn't take everybody hitting a grand slam. It takes everybody, you know, hopping up to the plate and and, and putting one between first and second base for, for a single, right? I mean, it's just about what is that part of the rope to pull for your community? Because it's without that skin in the game, without somebody you know, stepping up and saying, I want to be in charge of implementing this or being a piece of this, then we're just reliant on, on outside or somebody else coming in and doing the work for us. And that's never going to happen, right? So it's up to all of us to, to figure out what is that role for us inside of our communities, um, because we've all got a, a piece of the rope to pull. What a great uh, note to wrap up the panel, and I want to thank uh, all four of our distinguished speakers. Thank you so much for spending time and sharing your thoughts today. I also want to thank our audience. We have a lot of Kentucky leaders in the audience uh, that, uh, you know, if we were all together in a face-to-face -face kind of auditorium, we'd be having a real robust dis debate together. So uh, thank you all for participating in this conversation, and with that, we're going to transition on to the next part of our program. Thank you so much. So uh, the uh, the next part uh, of our agenda is we're gonna we're gonna uh, 
teed up with a question, uh, another poll question here. So, which agency is your organization most likely to submit an application to in the coming year? So, which federal agency? Uh, we have uh, a few highlighted here, uh, but also uh, we have an other category. So, uh, we put one minute on the clock. Um, so, please do uh, uh, let us know um, who you're applying and uh, so select all that apply so you can pick more than one. Um, so with that, um, why don't we uh, just, uh, we'll, we'll tee it up here and uh, shortly we'll have a, uh, a, an introduction of the panel uh, by our distinguished guest, uh, Mrs. Gail Manchin, the uh, federal co-chair of the Appalachian Regional Commission. But you've still got another 20 seconds on the clock, so please go ahead and uh, drop your, uh, your indication in the poll and we'll give you a second to do that. All right, so let's see what the results are. Well, looks like got a lot of no answers, so uh, hopefully folks uh, uh, are, are interested in the content, but we have uh, energy, commerce, and agriculture. Um, and I know that uh, folks wanted to hear from the Appalachian Regional Commission in our previous stakeholder engagement conversation. Uh, they were rated very highly as, uh, as one of the agencies they wanted to see in this event. In this event. So uh, appreciate um, our next uh, speaker who's gonna kick us off. We have uh, Gail Manchin, the federal co-chair for the Appalachian Regional Commission. Uh, Mrs. Manchin, would you like to share a few uh, remarks here before our panel? Yes, I, I certainly would. Thank you so much, Briggs, and uh, good morning uh, to everyone there in Kentucky, and also from people all around that have tuned in for this wonderful meeting supported by the IWG, uh, the work they're doing, and the way we are learning, meeting together and learning about our coal impacted communities is uh, not only in the ARC, but across the country. But today we're in Kentucky and uh, I was just so happy to see so many people that we met uh, when our team from ARC was down there not, not so long ago. Colby uh, Hall of Thor certainly was Glad to see you and, and hear your remarks. But hearing from speakers um, of the Eastern Kentucky has reaffirmed just how many commonalities that we share across the Appalachian region. So I, I want to thank all of the local and state partners, but also our agency partners uh, from across the country for their work on their initiative. And you'll be hearing from several of those in a little bit. I'll be introducing them, but certainly uh, the Department of uh, Commerce, Labor, Energy, Agriculture. Um, you know, it is about how we can work together and we should be setting that model as we're asking you across uh, the Appalachian region to stretch out and work across county and state lines, then our federal agencies need to be doing the same thing, reaching out to each other across federal lines to see how we can support um, the communities in our Appalachian region. So I'm just very honored and proud to be here today as the federal co-chair for the Appalachian region. For those of you that may not be as familiar, ARC is a federal state partnership based on the premise that cooperation at all levels of government, beginning at the local level, state and federal, is really necessary. It's the key to getting things done. And the partnership, this type of partnership has been a core mission 
of ARC since its inception in 1965. And that's why we're so pleased to, to be a part of this working group. It just certainly is a continuum of our mission. And so each of the 54 Appalachian counties in Kentucky, we know, uh, possess opportunities, great opportunities, as well as challenges. And the impacts of the downturn of the coal industry have been encompassing for all of our local communities and uh, across, again, across the ARC. So the ARC's power grants uh, is one of the ways that ARC supports uh, the, the effort to create a more vibrant economic future in our coal impacted counties. Since 2015, ARC has invested more than $287 million in 362 projects impacting 353 communities across uh, the Appalachian region. And in fact, this year, we announced our largest power grant package ever with 11 projects in Appalachian, Kentucky, receiving grants. So 11 new grants in Kentucky. And Colby talked some about uh, the grant and, and what it enables uh, the groups there in Kentucky to do. So uh, the other effort that we are beginning uh, is the Community Capacity Building Pilot Project, which we are joining forces, working together with EPA to do this. So this partnership will strengthen the depth and reach of the pilot program, helping our Appalachian communities maximize uh, this historic infusion of federal funding through ARPA and the Local Fiscal Recovery Fund. We will, it will be sort of a three-pronged effort in terms of training, sharing best practices, and offering technical assistance. So we are very honored to be a part of this effort to revitalize our coal communities um, and also to think again, to continue to think about regional efforts, working across county lines, working across state lines. We are going to be so much better set to succeed and to lift the Appalachian region together as we tackle some of the very same problems in our communities. And we at ARC are committed and are showing that commitment through our not only our power grants, our INSPIRE grants, but also through this community capacity pilot project building that will be uh, starting to register communities in the spring of 2022. So I want to thank all of you that have taken your time to be here today, either as a participant or as uh, someone coming in to learn about what's available and what is happening in your area. Again, it is uh, it is a great opportunity to learn from not only the local people that you have been hearing from, but now from our uh, federal, uh, our federal community, our federal agencies. And so I'm so happy now to introduce to you the people that you will be hearing from. Uh, first of all, uh, one of my colleagues from the Appalachian Regional Commission, Karen Fabiano. Uh, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we'll have Scott Moss. From the U.S. Department of Commerce, we'll have Catherine Bates. From the National Tele Telecommunications and Information Administration, and also Bertha Parlin from the Economic Development Administration. From the U.S. Department of Energy, we'll have Carla Frisch and from the U.S. Department of Labor, Brent Parton. 
These people have great resumes, but more importantly, they have great information to share with you. And so it's my pleasure to now turn over the floor to Karen Fabiana. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. I appreciate those kind words. Um, go ahead and get started with my slide presentation. Uh, I'm Karen Fabiano, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what ARC um, has to offer or may be of interest to you today. So, um, tell you just a real quick little um, bit of information. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of ARC, we are we serve the Appalachian region and we serve 13 states. And I'm excited to really say that uh, we now have three new counties added to our region um, effective this fall. We have 423 counties, which serves over 206,000 square miles and 26 million people in our region. And we have as partner 74 local development districts. Next slide, please. I just wanted to show you a map of Kentucky, and this is um, with our research department. We come up each year and determine each state's economic status. And this is Kentucky's economic status for fiscal year 22. And the, the, it's important to share that. I know, I think uh, Peter talked a little bit in his presentation this morning about um, the extent of distressed counties, and Kentucky has quite a few. And it's important just to reflect if you're thinking about ARC funds, this map will be an important guide because this will determine um, the match that is required with ARC dollars. And so if you are a distressed county, for instance, you would have a, a smaller match requirement that would be part of your ARC application. So just wanted to share this. This is the most current map that we have. And in terms of how this is determined, our research department looks at um, some basic indicators such as the three-year average of unemployment, the per capita market income, and the poverty rates. So next slide, please. At ARC, our mission, we have a vision and a mission. Our vision is that we're a region of great opportunity that will achieve socioeconomic parity with the nation. And our mission is to innovate, partner, and invest to build community capacity and strengthen economic growth in Appalachia. Next slide. At ARC, we have a variety of roles that we that we serve. We're a grant maker, a funder. We have uh, we are, do a lot of research and data provider. We, for example, we have a report that has an overview of coal and the economy in Appalachia. So if you go to our website, we have all of our research research information on the website that may be of interest to you. We also serve as a convener, and what we mean by that is we typically will bring federal partners. Um, and industry experts to some of our workshops, or when we're working on projects, we engage th with federal partners or industry, industry experts to help us with our projects. We also serve the role as uh, working with academies and institutes and in helping to build up um, support for individuals and students in the region. Next slide, please. ARC re recently um, approved a five-year strategic plan that began with our fiscal year 22 and goes through fiscal year 26. And this was just recently approved in October. And these are five strategic goals, and these are on our website, so you are more than welcome to take a, a look at that. But just to kind of give you a quick overview, our goals are to build Appalachian businesses, to build a workforce ecosystem, to build infrastructure in Appalachia, to build tourism and infrastructure in the region, or to build community leaders and capacity. And so it's just important as you work with possibly our funding that one of the projects you have in mind has to fit within these goals. And they're very flexible and, and easy to work with. But uh, just keep this in mind as you think about possible funding opportunities at ARC. Next slide, please. In terms of Kentucky, um, ARC provides dollars directly to Kentucky through one of our, our main state programs through the state area development or distressed funding programs. And, and Kentucky anticipates in excess of 23 million will be available for the state um, for fiscal year 22. If uh, typically a lot of these projects fall in the area of infrastructure or workforce types of projects, if you have a project that you think you might be interested in pursuing funding, 
it's important that you reach out to Kentucky State Program Manager Scott Sharp. Uh, he can help guide you through the, the parameters and requirements of the program. Some other resources that Kentucky also has in conjunction with ARC is area development districts. Those are regional planning districts that are a key partner to us in the state of Kentucky. And there's nine in the Appalachian region. And what they do is they help the state as well as ARC find the best projects for the region. Many times they drive initiatives and they provide support to you as a, as a possible applicant. Um, so they're a good resource to go to if you are interested in funding. In terms of Kentucky's um, timeline for state area development or distressed applications, they typically take pre-applications in October. But if you've obviously you've missed that deadline for this year, we may consider or Kentucky may consider an, a possible interest if you are invited by the commissioner. Once again, it's best that you work with Scott Sharp, uh, your state program manager, and he can guide you on those particulars. Next slide, please. In terms of ARC and resources that we provide directly to applicants, Gail mentioned earlier about our power program and highlight some of the things that she mentioned with what we've accomplished to date. And as you can see, uh, we've distributed a lot of dollars to a lot of projects in the region. And Kentucky, with this last round, had 11 projects. And to date, since 2015, Kentucky has received over 55 grants through the POWER program. Next slide. Some other funding initiatives at ARC that may be of interest to you, um, as been mentioned in some of our other speakers, uh, Kentucky, like much of the region, has experienced issues with um, substance use disorders, um, substance abuse issues. And what we have is um, some funding that was provided through Congress through our INSPIRE program. And we've funded two rounds to date. Each year we have approximately $10 million available. And the goal of this program is to look at partners or nonprofits or organizations that come in and have projects that are interested in a recovery ecosystem for workforce reentry for, for participants or residents who have gone through recovery. Another program that is not directly through ARC, but through one of our federal partners through the Department of Labor, is the Workforce Opportunity for Rural, rural Communities. We have uh, partnered with Department of Labor, and the region has received over $29 million in demonstration grants over the last couple rounds. And this is to provide support primarily for workforce development initiatives. Next slide, please. A new item that we're really excited about at ARC is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was made and in, signed into law last week with the President. Um, ARC looks to receive over $1 billion over five years, which comes to approximately $200 million per year beginning this fiscal year. And there's another $1.25 billion over five years that will be dedicated to funding the Appalachian Development Highway System at the Federal Highway Administration. Stay tuned and, and um, work with your state program manager as well as look at our website. We're just beginning to determine how we will distribute these funds. So it's exciting. This will be in addition to our allocation. One other area that ARC does quite a bit of work with is investing in our local residents. And some of the programs that we offer is our Leadership Institute. We provide uh, some funds through the Oak Ridge STEM program for middle schoolers and high school students. And we have an Appalachian teaching program as well. Some other areas that we invest in residents is our entrepreneurship camp. And we also provide an Appalachian nonprofit resource center where nonprofits can reach out and, and have some training or some assistance um, through a contractor that helps us with all kinds of areas that um, nonprofits might need assistance, such, in, such as financial management training. Next slide, please. Important thing to remember is that the first place to start, of course, is with your ARC state program manager, and that's Scott Sharp. And this is his contact information. So if you have a project that you would like to discuss and see if possibly ARC might be a funding resource, uh, please reach out to Scott. Next slide. 
And at ARC, um, I provided our federal contact information. Here's my information. You're for, feel free to contact me if you have any questions, and I can certainly guide you. I work with the local development districts and the power program, but I can certainly put you in contact with many of our other colleagues. And if you have a non-construction project, Megan Robinson works with the with projects in Kentucky. And for construction projects, Greg Faulkner um, works with construction projects for the state of Kentucky. So that's just some basic information, and we look forward to working with you and hope that you have something in mind and look forward to, to any questions or ideas that you might have. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Scott Moss at USDA. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Scott Moss. I'm the program director for the business and cooperative programs here at Rural Development. And I was asked today to just give a brief overview of rural development, who we are, and also what programs that we offer. It's impossible in the time that's allotted to basically go over all our programs, but wanted to just to give you some highlights of what we can do and how we serve rural, rural Kentucky. And as the title states, uh, we're your partner in prosperity. We, we can do anything tied to rural America. So if it comes to infrastructure, to housing, to businesses, et cetera, we're here to help be your partner and as we prosper in rural Kentucky. Next slide, please. So rural development is basically is set up in three different uh, divisions. It's rural business cooperative service, rural business housing service, and then rural utility services. Next slide. And basically, a national view is basically where they're located in 47 states. Each has a separate state office. Uh, here in Kentucky, we have 12 area offices and five satellite offices. Our state office is located in Lexington. And uh, of course, our national office is in DC. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the programs themselves. Next slide. Uh, the Rural Business Cooperative Services uh, you know, our main objective with any business program is job creation and, and jobs being saved. So as we look, as we distribute our, our programs, uh, you know, our main objective is to create jobs. Next slide. One of the biggest tools or the main tools that we use is the Business and Industry Guaranteed Loan Program. This is a guaranteed loan program through commercial lenders that will help with any aspect of a, a business development, either expansion, startup, purchase of land, construction, purchase of equipment, uh, machinery, supplies, inventory, or also refinancing debt that's currently out on their portfolio. Basically, this is a guaranteed loan through a commercial lender. We can go into a $25 million loan. Uh, basically, the guarantee allows the lender to go outside their norm when it comes to their financial covenants. For example, it allows them to go up to extend terms for up to 30 years on real estate, up to 15 years or useful life on, on machinery and equipment, and up to seven years on uh, working capital. We do not offer any revolving loan uh, type credit, but we do allow for working capital, et cetera. Again, we can go up to a $25 million loan. Uh, there are some limitations, the primary one being the, the location of the business. It has to be in a rural area. So that's a population of 50,000 or less. So there are areas in Kentucky that are not eligible for this program, but uh, basically 80, 85% of the state is eligible. Next slide, please. We also offer a variety of different energy programs and, and there's a number of them listed here and I'll just go over them very quickly with you. But the Advanced Biofuel Payment Program or the 9005 program, is a subsidy program that's based on quarterly production numbers to promote uh, the manufacturing of renewable fuels such as biodiesel, ethanol, and, and bio-based pellets. Uh, the biorefinery renewable chemical and bio-based product manufacturing assistance program, it's a lot of words, uh, 9003, is for the development, construction, and retrofitting of technologically new commercially scale processing and manufacturing equipment that, and required facilities that will be used to convert renewable chemicals and bio-based outputs into user products on a commercial scale. 
For example, end use would be such as fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, pesticides, plastics, lubricants, and oils. Under this program, it's a guaranteed loan program only. We can go up to a $250 million guarantee or a $250 million loan, excuse me, at an 80% guarantee. And basically the application process is a two-step process with the first being a letter of intent being with a deadline of March 2nd. The next program is the Repowering Assistant Program, the 9003 program. This encourages the use of renewable biomass as replacement fuel source for fossil fuels to, use, to be used to provide process heat or power in operation in eligible bio refineries. This is a program currently we are waiting on ANOSA for funding, but that there is a potential operate, uh, opportunity for funding moving forward. And then there's the REIT program, the Rural Energy for America program, which is our, one of our major programs, most active program. Under that program, there's a variety of different individual sub programs, one being the, the Energy Audits Renewable Energy Development Grants. This is a, a grant to help subsidize the cost of energy audits and technical review ports or renewable projects. This is uh, a grant through our higher learning, such as uh, UK, uh, Berea College, et cetera. But it's a, a, a great resource for uh, help cost, uh, bring down the cost or subsidize the cost of energy audits or technical reports. Also, the, a new program called the Energy Efficiency Equipment Program through REAP. This is a guaranteed loan that's set up up to $25 million for energy efficiency equipment tied to new startups or uh, to uh, retrofit of existing manufacturing facilities. So this is an excellent opportunity for uh, new for capital uh, options if you're looking at expansion or adding new equipment. Next slide. The REIT program uh, primarily is set up for agric agricultural producers and rural small business to help with any type of energy efficiency upgrades or renewable energy projects. This is a grant and loan program where the applicant can receive up to 25% of the project cost as a grant. We also uh, can loan up to 75% of the project cost as a guaranteed loan only, or we can do a combo where a grant be 25%, up to 50% of the project as a loan, and then 25% investment by the applicant. We can go up, grants can go up to 250,000 for energy efficiency and up to 500,000 for renewable energy projects. Energy efficiency, as, as the uh, slide states, is any type of improvement that will save energy. Renewable projects can be solar, wind, turbines, anaerobic digesters, any type of uh, uh, bio-based uh, solar systems, anything of that nature. Uh, application deadline is March 31st. Uh, we accept applications throughout the year and would highly encourage you to look at, at the REIT program if you're looking at any type of energy efficiency or renewable energy project. Next, next slide, uh, we'll go into the rural housing service. But before I do that, uh, you heard a lot of earlier on the speakers regarding our partnership with, uh, uh, with them regarding other funding sources. We have a variety of different uh, uh, grant and loan programs for nonprofits that are basically passed through to those entities and then they pass that to through to ultimate recipients. Uh, but the majority of those features have some type of program through us. And if you're interested in that, please feel free to give us a call and we'd be more than happy to, to uh, talk to you more about that. So the rural housing, next slide please. Basically there's two different main programs here, the 502 Direct Home Loan Program and the 502 Guaranteed Loan Program. These both loans, uh, grant loan programs are there to help low income or very low income families purchase homes, help with payment subsidies, et cetera. This allows the, the applicant basically to have no down payment, 100% of funding, and also help with closing costs, can be financed, et cetera. This is an excellent opportunity for new uh, home buyers, et cetera, in rural, con rural Kentucky and, and very active program. Next slide. You also have the 504 program, which is the home repair program. This is a program that will help disabled uh, individuals or low income individuals uh, make repairs to an existing facility, existing home, either uh, core 
uh, repairs or energy savings repairs. This is a loan and grant program and it's available. Both of these programs, 504 and 502, are available throughout the year and accept applications throughout the year. Next slide. We also have the multifamily program, multifamily housing program. This provides affordable multifamily rental housing in rural areas by financing projects geared for low income, elderly and disabled individuals and families, as well as domestic farm laborers. This is a not only a loan and grant program to the actual owner, but it also includes subsidies, rent subsidies to the potential renters. So this is a very active program uh, that we service for many years. Next slide. Rural Utility Service, next slide please, is a, a variety of different programs that help with the infrastructure and uh, uh, of, of both water and waste and, and also provide community facilities grants and loans. Under the community facilities lands, grants and loans, excuse me, uh, these are basically for nonprofits, but they help with any type of purchase of daycare, firehouse, uh, responder vehicles, equipment, community centers, et cetera. Uh, this is available for any nonprofit, public bodies, Indian tribes. It's a grant loan program. It's available throughout the year. Uh, however, there is uh, some limitations on population there. It has to be located in a population of 20,000 or less. Next slide. For the electric programs, the infrastructure for electric programs, we basically that's administered directly through our national office. But Mike Norman is our local uh, rep that would be uh, your primary contact for any type of electrical uh, Infrastructure questions, uh, his contact information is there. Mike serves not only Kentucky, but Indiana, and he'd be more than happy to talk to you regarding any projects you might have there. On our next slide is uh, regarding telecommunications program. And we heard a little bit earlier about the USDA reconnect program. Uh, James Wilson is our primary rep in Kentucky. He also serves Arkansas. Uh, but James would be the contact that uh, that you would have if you have any questions regarding that. U.S. Rural Develop, uh, our role in that is basically to be the uh, middleman between James and the applicant, but we're here to serve and, and also to help James in any way as we look forward. And there's going to be additional opportunities through rural development in, in our broadband telecommunications program as we move forward. And those programs will probably be really Released or announced in very short nature. All right, next slide is our water and environmental programs. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, basically, this is uh, tied to fresh water. We heard that earlier on discussion about the need for fresh water, availability of fresh water, and also for a uh, waste material and, and uh, basically uh, disposal waste. So, this is a grant loan program it's administered through our water and waste division. Uh, basically, it, it's available throughout the year. Uh, there is some population uh, restrictions of 10,000 or less, but again, we they'd be more than happy to talk to you directly about a specific project that you might have in your area. The final slide I have is my contact information. And basically, under this, you can see that I am, again, I'm the program director for the business programs. Uh, Blaine Barnes is the program director for our single family and multifamily housing programs. And Kimberly McKay is our program director for the RUS Rural Utility Service. If you have any questions, you can contact our state office at 224-7300 and they'll connect you directly to either Scott Blaine or, or, my, or Kimberly or Blaine or myself, or you can contact me directly and I'd be more than happy to forward any information to you. Uh, that you might have. Uh, look forward to any questions that might come up at, later on. But again, we're a partner. We're here to help and we look forward to uh, serving you in any way that we can uh, to develop rural uh, Kentucky. So I'll pass the screen now over to Catherine uh, Bates with US, U.S. Department of Commerce. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Can everybody hear me? I assume I'm waiting on my slides. There they are. Um, hi, uh, 
My name is Catherine Bates, and I want to thank you for having me today as a Tennessee volunteer whose first job out of college many years ago was working to repurpose coal communities in East Tennessee. This effort is near and dear to my heart. Next slide. I work at the Office of Internet Connectivity and Growth at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. It's a mouthful. NTIA at the U.S. Department of Commerce. What is NTIA, you ask? We're a rather small agency who is charged with advising the White House on telecom policies and expanding broadband access and adoption, expanding the use of federal spectrum, and ensuring the internet remains the engine for economic growth. Never before was this more needed than during the last 18 months. Before I talk about the infrastructure and investment, I can't, I trip over this all the time, infrastructure investment and Jobs Act funding, I want to go quickly through some resources that NTIA currently has that can help your communities connect to broadband. First, something that NTIA has been working hard on over the past de decade is interagency coordination. You've heard about the USDA, the FCC, ARC, EDA, broadband funding. There's a lot of agencies that are out there uh, funding broadband. So through this, we developed a one-stop shop for federal broadband funding. So if you go to our website, which I'll give the address at the end, um, you can click on federal funding and go to this tool the funding search and um, click on what type of funding you're looking for. Is it digital inclusion, infrastructure, what type of community you are, um, and uh, find some funding. We update this tool annually, and there's been some big changes in the last year. So if we're not exactly up to date, um, we are getting there closely. Um, next slide. Next, I wanna highlight the State Broadband Leaders Network. On our website, you can find out what each state in the country and the territories are focused on in broadband. Kentucky's information is there, including the contact information for Mary Pat Reagan, um, who is leading the broadband efforts in Kentucky. I work closely with Mary Pat and can tell you she is very accessible and will be key into the next tranche of funding. Next slide. Lastly, I want to highlight our Indicators of Broadband Dean map, the first interactive public map that allows users to explore different data sets of where the different data sets out there about where people do not have quality internet access. You can click on your area and get an idea of what broadband is like in your area, and this is based on UCLA speed test data. It's based on some federal funding programs. It's based on um, Microsoft data. So it's, it's comprehensive, it's not perfect, but it can give you an idea of what broadband's like in your area. All of these resources can be found on our website, www.broadbandusa.ntia.doc.gov. On the uh, next slide. So now, <laughs> I'd like to talk about what Colby Hall from SOAR called the golden age of broadband funding. And I laughed when I heard that. Um, the IIJA broadband funding, $65 billion in federal funding for broadband. As you can see, NTIA will be administering almost 50 billion of this funding um, in four different programs. We call it the BEAD um, for the infrastructure, the Digital Equity Act, the Middle Mile, and the Tribal. Um, and on the side of the slide, you can see that the FCC got some funding, US Reconnect got more funding, so there's other additional funding, but the bulk of it is coming to NTIA. And of that 50, almost $50 billion, $42 billion will be in the BEAD program, which BEAD stands for Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. Uh, I think um, it's a formula based program to fund broadband infrastructure that will go directly to states, including Kentucky. I want to emphasize what Colby said. The money won't solve all the connectivity issues and local coordination with the state with the state will be key to the success of this program. 
It's mandated in the legislation that states coordinate with local governments. It's um, it's something that NTIA believes strongly in, and we've seen it uh, work in many communities. Um, it is my wish that every state and region had a SOAR um, and had the the um, that resources that Eastern Kentucky has um, to help support this coordination. Um, we're working on that. We're, um, I'm already going to reach out to Colby and talk to him about what they're doing in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and we hope that every region of Kentucky has something like that. Uh, next slide. NTIA will be start will be starting virtual listening sessions on these programs. They are big programs. We have 180 days to get the NOFOs out, which are notice of funding opportunities for the BEAD and the Digital Equity Act. Um, so we're starting our virtual listening sessions, hopefully December 15th. Um, I'm not sure of the date. It's going to be in mid-December before the holidays with our first one where we get input from local communities, from states, from internet service providers, from community organizations, um, what they would like to see in the NOFO. Um, and we're going to do some education on what is in the legislation because we do have some uh, limits in there. Um, but to receive updates from us, um, it's best to go, uh, sign up for our newsletter on our website and we send out periodic emails about uh, things. We have current grant programs and we have these new grant programs. Again, the website address is broadbandusa.ntia.doc.gov. So I look forward to questions. Um, I don't know if I can answer a lot on the new funding. Um, we are just in the process of um, grappling with some policy issues around it, and we look forward to working with um, both the state and the local community uh, organizations, local governments, um, and the providers to make this program successful and reach the goal of the administration's connecting 100% of Americans. Um, so now I would like to turn this over to my colleague, Bertha Parlin, in our sister agency at Commerce, EDA. Good morning to everyone. I'm Bertha Parton. I am the Economic Development Representative for the state of Kentucky at large. I serve the Atlanta region. Uh, and uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about some of EDA's programs uh, and available funding. EDA is a bureau within the U.S. Department of Commerce that is charged uh, with leading the federal economic development agenda. And at the end of the day, our goal is to foster job opportunities and private investment in our distressed regions. And EDA is uh, able to achieve its mission by making strategic and transformative investments through a robust set of funding programs. Uh, we have uh, traditional funding yearly under our Economic Adjustment Assistance Program. This is one of our most flexible funding programs, and it focuses on areas that either have experienced or are under threat uh, of serious structural damage to the underlying economic base. Uh, we, uh, this uh, umbrella of funding uh, allows us to uh, fund revolving loan fund programs. It also serves uh, as the mechanism through which we are able to uh, fund disaster programs, including the uh, CARES Act funding that we received last year and uh, the funding that we currently have available under the American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, we also have a yearly allocation from uh, under our Public Works Program. And this is our uh, typical infrastructure program uh, in which we fund um, projects that will attract new industry or encourage business expansion and diversify local economies and generate or retain long-term private sector jobs and investment. We also have a planning program in which we partner with uh, Kentucky's 15 area development districts to uh, do some intensive planning. We also uh, partner with Indian tribes and other eligible areas uh, to do short and long-term planning efforts. Uh, 
Uh, through EDA's Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, we also have a Build a Scale program, uh, which builds regional economies through scalable startups. It includes support to entrepreneurship, acceleration of company growth, and increased access to risk capital across regional economies. We also have Trade Adjustment Assistance for Firms program, in which we fund 11 Trade Adjustment Assistance Centers that help strengthen the competitiveness of American companies that have lost domestic sales and employment because of increased imports of similar goods and services. We also have a university center program in which we partner with academia uh, that makes the varied and vast resources of universities available to the economic development community. We have a research and national technical assistance program that funds research, evaluation, and national technical assistance projects to promote competitiveness and innovation in distressed rural areas. And we have a local technical assistance program that provides technical assistance in order to assist leaders in the public and nonprofit sectors in distressed areas to make optimal decisions on local economic development issues. We also have a revolving loan fund program as part of our EAA program. We have established uh, revolving loan fund programs in the majority of the 15 area development district, as well as some other areas in which uh, small business uh, have access to capital at uh, low interest uh, uh, loans. Uh, before we change the slide, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of what our investments have been over the past fiscal year. Uh, Last fiscal year, FY21, EDA received $166 million in requests from the state of Kentucky. Of those, we were able to approve over $25 million in projects. And of those, nearly half of those were made in coal impacted areas. So EDA uh, definitely uh, has made investments in cold impacted area, and we have seen some uh, major results from those projects. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Currently, um, we were uh, allocated $3 billion under the American Rescue Plan Act, and as part of that, EDA um, put out on the street six notices of funding opportunities uh, that covers a variety of programs. Uh, one of those uh, is the statewide planning research and networks program. $90 million was allocated in that program. Every state in the nation received a million dollars. Uh, Kentucky received a million dollars under that program and that funding uh, is going to the um, Education and Workforce Development Cabinet for broadband planning efforts. Uh, we also received uh, $1 billion under the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. We accepted uh, letters of intent through October the 19th, I think it was, uh, for uh, for uh, projects. Th these are large scale projects that, that that uh, coalitions come together to plan uh, that that's going to transform the uh, economies and uh, give give areas uh, the ability uh, to rebound from the pandemic. The ARPA funding specifically targets uh, projects that that are in response to the pandemic. So so we expect early in December to announce the finalists for the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, uh, and the full applications are going to be due in March. So we're excited uh, to uh, uh, make those announcements and see which applicants can move forward in that competition. Uh, we have a travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation uh, program. There was $750 million uh, allocated under that program. Atlanta received about $24 million in its own allocation under that program. 
uh, and, and this will fund projects in areas that have uh, had impact from the pandemic on the tourism sector and, and allow areas to, to develop projects that, that will move forward uh, and help them overcome some of the loss in the tourism industry. Uh, uh, as part of that program, we also had a non-competitive grant that went directly to the state of Kentucky. Uh, the state received approximately $5 million for uh, for uh, tourism projects, and that is being uh, administered under uh, the uh, tourism cabinet at the state, and is um, and is uh, uh, providing some marketing uh, and through the state uh, in the different uh, tourism sectors uh, to promote tourism and bring people back to Kentucky. Uh, we have an economic adjustment assistance program. There was $500 million available in, in that program. And let me back up to say we have coal allocations uh, set aside in both the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. There is uh, $100 million in that uh, challenge that is going uh, directly to coal impacted communities. And under the EAA program, we also have a coal allocation. Uh, the Atlanta region received its own allocation under the EAA program, and approximately 50 million of that uh, is uh, for coal impacted areas in the Atlanta region. Uh, and, but there's $200 million available nationwide under the uh, EAA program for coal impacted areas. Uh, we also have an indigenous communities program uh, with $100 million available uh, for projects that um, that impact indigenous communities and we have a good jobs challenge uh, there's 500 million dollars available under that program uh, and, and this is to um, develop sectorial partnerships and provide training and wraparound services uh, for to put folks back to work it, it's a program in which employer uh, partnerships is very important um, in, in order to get folks back to work Okay, next, uh, okay, okay. Uh, EDA's investment priorities, uh, these uh, are the priorities in which we, um, in which we make uh, funding. We, we look at these investment priorities anytime we get an application in, and these are used to evaluate the grants that EDA receives. Uh, equity is at the top of our list, and equity emphasizes the focus on unserved and underserved communities. Uh, in which we have a lot in Kentucky in our distressed areas uh, and populations that have not been able uh, to move forward um, in, in gain economic prosperity. Uh, recovery and resiliency uh, is, is an important priority. Uh, workforce development, manufacturing, technology-based priority is a priority. Uh, environmentally sustainable development and exports and uh, foreign domestic investment is also um, a, uh, an important investment priority for us. Uh, our eligible applicants are uh, district organizations, Indian tribes, state, county, city, or other political subdivisions of a state. Uh, institutions of higher education or a consortium of institutions and public or private nonprofit organizations so long as they are working in cooperation with officials of a political subdivision. And EDA uh, is not authorized to provide grants to individuals or to for-profit entities. Next slide. Um, we have available on our website an abundance of resources. Um, if you sign up for our newsletter, you will be aware of all of our funding opportunities. Um, you can also receive more information on the American Rescue Plan Act uh, at our website, there are an array of webinar uh, recordings that we've held, uh, various webinars. Um, we uh, have um, fact sheets, uh, frequently asked questions uh, posted there that, that will help you uh, get through uh, some of the uh, some of the questions you may have about the application process as well. My contact information is available here, and I'm available to provide technical assistance relative to the grant programs that we have available. Now, I will pass it over to Carla Fish with DOE.
Hello, everyone. Very happy to be with you this morning. And I think we've learned a lot already about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or as we like to call it, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. I'm Carla Frisch with the U.S. Department of Energy, and I lead our Office of Policy. Uh, so hope you all are feeling energetic here and ready to learn more about what's possible with this new bipartisan infrastructure law. Just to give you a bit of context, uh, I hate to say it, but I think you might already know that Kentucky has been suffering for decades from a lack of investment in infrastructure. And we saw the American Society of Civil Engineers gave Kentucky a C minus on its infrastructure report card. Uh, but the good news here is that the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, will make life better for millions of Kentuckians. And how is that? Number one, as we scale up the development and deployment of clean energy technologies, there will be job opportunities. Uh, so for Americans across the U.S. on building new clean energy infrastructure, and two, a real effort is underway to make sure that every American worker and community can benefit from and see their future in those clean energy solutions. So I want to tell you about the four main areas where there are programs and activities flowing through the Department of Energy. So uh, the first of those on the next slide is investing in American manufacturing and workers. So one example of what's already underway in Kentucky is the Department of Energy has some work with the University of Kentucky that's focused on extraction and scaling up production of rare earth minerals, and that can come from coal and from coal byproducts. Now, what the bipartisan infrastructure law does that you see here on this slide is a significant investment in bolstering domestic supply chains. So this is all parts of the supply chain from critical minerals to battery manufacturing and recycling and some specific investments in hydrogen supply chains. There are investments to support coal and fossil fuel communities. And one of those is a new $750 million grant program to support advanced energy technology manufacturing projects in coal communities. And the interagency working group that's hosting us today is going to help provide some information about how communities can get access to those resources. And then, of course, it's very important to invest in the workforce. So part of what the bipartisan infrastructure law does is make uh, additional investments in building, training, and assessment centers to make sure that workers have access to training if they choose to take that training and look for different types of opportunities. So that's what has passed in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Now there's additional investments underway uh, under discussion. So that's in the partner bill to the bipartisan infrastructure law, which the president signed. There's the Build Back Better Act that's passed the House and is under discussion now in the Senate. So if that were to pass in the Senate, it also includes significant investments in American manufacturing and workers, particularly providing benefits for companies that support domestic manufacturing. So helping onshore, reshore, and build new domestic manufacturing if that Build Back Better Act were to pass. Now, the second big area on the next slide is expanding access to energy efficiency and clean energy. This is for families, for communities, and for businesses. So already Kentucky has made really significant investments through something we call the Weatherization Assistance Program. And this helps low-income residents and homes to weatherize, so stop up leaks and make sure that the heat is staying in in the winter and the cool is staying in during the summer. So that provides all kinds of benefits for low income households to reduce their costs. And the bipartisan infrastructure law, as you see here on the slide, makes significant new investments in that weatherization assistance program. Similarly, Kentucky already has great work underway on efficiency, energy efficiency, and clean energy technology 
through the Kentucky Housing Corporation, through the Kentucky Clean Fuels Coalition. And there are investments in the bipartisan infrastructure law to build on those. So to support cleaner schools for our children and teachers and uh, to send grants through communities and through the state energy office. Now, in addition to this, uh, from the Department of Energy, there's also investments from Department of Transportation, particularly on electric vehicle chargers. So we looking at the numbers right now, uh, roughly 73,000 people in Kentucky work in the motor vehicle sector. So more opportunities there coming, with, especially with almost $70 million coming to Kentucky over the next five years to support the expansion of EV charging networks in the state. So big opportunity there. Now that is what has passed already. And then the Build Back Better Act, which is under discussion in the Senate, that would do even more. So it includes programs to help um, investments in whole home retrofits and in efficient appliances. Now, the third area is on the next slide is delivering reliable, clean and affordable power to more Americans. So, as you all know, and have experienced in the last decade, Kentucky had 26 extreme weather events that cost the state up to 10 billion in damages. So, under the bipartisan infrastructure law, Kentucky will receive dollars to help protect against wildfires and against cyber attacks and including um, investments to fund to cap and seal abandoned coal mines. So we heard about that uh, from an earlier speaker. So this is all about making sure our electrical grid and what's connected to it is ready for the extreme events and cyber issues that we are facing now, and also maintaining our existing generation fleet to keep that clean power online. Now, if the Build Back Better Act were to pass the Senate, that would mean significantly more investments to help consumers take advantage of that clean, affordable power and, and make sure that they could easily afford energy efficiency, electric vehicles, solar power, all kinds of opportunities there if that were to pass. Now, lastly, on the next slide, uh, there's an investment in clean energy demonstrations. So demonstration is an important stage and step of the technology development process. So often it's building the first of a kind or the first commercial scale facility, and that helps test it out, see if it works, and then hand it over to the private sector to grow and scale. So here there's the opportunity for Kentucky to compete for more than 21 billion in funding for new demonstration projects and research hubs. Those are in hydrogen and battery recycling and carbon capture. And the intent is that many of those projects and hubs be located in hard hit energy communities that create jobs and often take advantage of the same skills fossil fuel workers already have. So that's the whirlwind tour of the bipartisan infrastructure law for energy. And on the last slide here, I just wanted to share and make sure you have the contact information for our Appalachia Regional Specialist, Torin Collins, who is interested in engaging with you all and can answer any questions you have. Then we've got, if you wanna make sure that you're receiving email notifications about these funding opportunities, you can do that at fedconnect.gov or click on this link here um, to get sign up for DOE listservs for different offices. And I wanted to close by telling you about an opportunity that's on the table right now. So I was talking about what's coming. Uh, um, as the previous speakers have said, a lot of that is under development and will come your way soon. But what you can do right now is we have an open application for something that we're called calling Communities Leap, Communities Leading on that clean energy of the future. So this any community can come and apply to Department of Energy to get technical assistance to plan for the clean energy future you want, whether that is in uh, transportation, whether that is in how to create clean power, um, lots of opportunity there. So the, we're in the middle of the registration and application window right now. The registration closes December 15th. So you register and say, you know, you're interested in submitting an application. And then the applications are due by December 17th. 
Um, we have office hours about this on December 7th to help uh, folks uh, get more information if they'd like. And all of this information is about the link is included in the link here on the resources slide. So significant opportunities for Kentucky on the way and one already open right here through community sleep. So thank you so much for inviting Department of Energy to be part of this. And now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague at the US Department of Labor, Brent Parton. Thank you for that, Carla. And good morning, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, my name is Brent Parton, Senior Advisor for Workforce at the Employment and Training Administration at the US Department of Labor. I know we're running behind and we wanna leave as much time for Q&A as possible. So I'll just say a few things on the top line about why we're thrilled to, to be joined here with our federal partners, but more importantly, all these incredible folks, in the state of Kentucky, and, and really just underscore our willingness and excitement to be partners and supporters of the work that needs to happen at the federal, at the federal state and local level to be able to support the resilience and growth of these energy communities. Um, I would say that where I sit at the Department of Labor, one of our core missions is on workforce development and investing in, in the American workers and investing in communities. We do that through a number of different uh, programs and lenses that I won't go through in great detail today, but I'll say this, we have incredible partners at the state of Kentucky, at the public workforce system, the state and local workforce boards, the Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board at the state level, but also the network of workforce development boards that are at, operate across the regions of Kentucky are really our core counterparts and partners to ensure that communities have the resources they need to not only support workers who have been impacted by transitions within our economy, including energy transitions, but also to be able to ensure that there are new opportunities being supported to connect our youth, our transitioning workers, as well as folks just looking for another opportunity to take advantage of, that they have the access to the training, access to the transportation services, access to the career counseling and academic support that is needed to connect with a good job. We do wanna be a national partner and resource to all of you. Um, our goal is to use all the levers we have to support the resilience and growth of communities across the state of Kentucky. And I'll say that our North Star that we bring to this work is about job quality. It's not enough to say that we're going to support workers that are impacted by a transition, whether that's in our labor market due to an economic downturn or a, or a longer standing energy transition. It's not enough to say that we'll get you the skills to get a job. What we are laser focused on is ensuring that these could be quality jobs. We know that the impact that uh, the revenue producing efforts within our communities can have to be able to ensure that there are new opportunities for growth across sectors whether that's in clean energy or whether that's in advanced manufacturing, whether that's in information technology, healthcare, welding, a range of number spaces. We want to ensure any worker that receives training and support through our funds, that that is being supported for a good paying job with family sustaining wages, the worker voice that's needed to really ensure workers' needs and benefits are at the table, but to also ensure that industries that are looking to relocate and grow and to create opportunities in new communities have the access to the skilled workforce they need. In addition to job quality, a key frame, whether this is through our work with the public workforce system and the network of workforce boards across the country, or through competitive grants that we put out, is that we really are intending to focus on local solutions. The decision-making for how federal resources for workforce development are used is really pushed down to the state and local level, again, through these workforce boards that are majority business, but includes key stakeholders from labor, from other federal entities, and state and local entities, local and state public elected officials are part of these workforce boards, education and training partners are part of these workforce boards. We want to put the decisions into their hands of how they want to use federal resources for workforce development to best meet the needs of workers in their communities. The last thing I, I will say in terms of cross-cutting principle is partnership development. I think we've heard from a number of our folks that have been here from our federal family, as well as our speakers in the front from Kentucky, that we know there's no silver bullet or easy solutions here. Part of the reason for that, however, is because none of us has the entire solution. We know that workforce development funding has to be leveraged and combined with economic development resources, with resources to support new infrastructure development in order to create and connect people to those quality jobs. At the same time, as Carla really clearly laid out with things like the infrastructure bill, 
if we don't leverage our workforce development partners, we can have the potential for creation of all these jobs, but we need clear pathways for the workers that need the most to get access to those good paying jobs. So when we invest in workforce development, whether this is again through the formulas that uh, reach into our local workforce boards, or whether this is through our national competitive grant programs that I'll say a little bit in just about a second, it's always about partnership development across workforce, economic development, education, as well as key partners in areas like transportation and energy with a clear beat on where there are clear opportunities for supporting economic development and communities and the expansion of good jobs. In terms of the how, again, I'm not going, we have a number of different workforce programs and that I would be more than happy to spend some time and we'll have a breakout session to talk a little bit about more in great detail. But there's really two big ways that we invest in communities and why we're excited to make sure that partners locally across the state of Kentucky have access to the resources we have. Number one is we provide resources to support workers that have been dislocated by some impact within a business, within an economy, within their local community. The support for dislocated workers, as we call them in, in the parlance of our federal formulas, is something that we support both through grants that can be made to states, of which the state of Kentucky has benefited from dislocated worker or disaster grants to support workers in the near term who face uh, dislocation due to a range of different causes but also for individuals that lose their jobs or are looking for transitions, our workforce boards and American job centers that they oversee become a one-stop shop for where those workers can go find out where are their resources that can support them, not only to get education and training, but access to things like supportive services, childcare, transportation, uh, career counseling. We wanna ensure that all those resources are combined and integrated in one place. And so your local workforce boards, many of which are represented on this call, are really a critical community asset and resource for ensuring that the range of different programs that flow into communities from the federal government, from the Department of Labor, where I sit, can be integrated and used to meet the actual needs of people. So partnering with local workforce boards, having them at the table to be thinking about not only how to respond to sort of immediate disruptions, but long-term planning is key. To that second point, the second big bucket that I wanna make sure everybody knows about how we do what we do to support you all is we do have a range of national competitive grants that we invest in communities in a range of different workforce strategies, registered apprenticeships, community colleges, youth focused grants to help young people get work experience into good paying jobs in their local communities to help communities retain the young talent they need. We have sector focused grants meaning grants that are focused on bringing together industry leaders from areas like manufacturing, healthcare, even information technology to help build out new talent pipelines. These national competitive grants really are a key bonus that help us develop and chart a new way for supporting the workforce of the future that's needed in communities, but also getting workers and communities the support they need now. These grants are that can range in the millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands, up to the tens of millions of dollars, are things that we at the department and the Biden-Harris administration in particular are committed to ensuring that every community can access these, not just those that can hire the best grant writers, not just those that have the beat of connection. So I hope today is a little bit about starting a conversation and building awareness of where you can become aware of where our existing or new competitive grant opportunities might be out there to support work at the local level. But one of the key things we are doing is targeting resources specifically to energy communities for work grants that were workforce opportunity for rural communities that were brought up earlier by Chairwoman Manchin are a critical area where we have partnered with the Appalachian Regional Commission to provide targeted support to our communities within the Appalachian Regional Commission. But for the first time ever, we really prioritized energy communities as the, as the core of those investments. That's a model. We have the opportunity to really double down on that and be thinking about across the range of national competitive grants we have available that we're able to ensure that you all know about them and most critically have the resources and technical assistance you need to be able to access and tap into those resources. Starting in January, we'll have a new tranche of a set of investments that include youth, community colleges, and apprenticeships. But as has been mentioned before, the Build Back Better agenda, the Build Back Better Act, which is a companion to the infrastructure, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act that Carla just mentioned quite a bit about, would really supersize those investments. It is important we start talking now about what those investments will be and open up the dialogue to ensure you all across communities in Kentucky are able to access those resources when they come out there. 
I can promise you we'll work tirelessly on our end of the Department of Labor. My boss, Secretary Walsh, is committed to ensuring that every community has the ability to access those resources and take advantage of this historic investment in workforce development, particularly the energy communities that need this support on the ground today and for years to come. So with that in mind, I want to just point out that there's a number of things that we could dig into details for, but us here at the Department of Labor and the National Office and by colleagues who are in the regional office who work very closely with our state and local counterparts across the state of Kentucky are here to be resources for you. We'll make sure you have all the contact information, but also your local workforce board representatives. Again, many of you I know who are out there right now can be critical ways to tap in, become aware, and figure out how to take advantage of the federal resources that exist to support these activities at the community level. So with that, I just want to again extend my welcomeness to partner and starting the conversation today. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Brent. Uh, what a great way to close us off with a uh, worker-centered, uh, very positive message. And uh, given that we're short on time, I want to uh, summarize a little bit what we heard as well as thank our panelists, uh, Karen, Scott, Catherine, Bertha, Carla, and Brent. You guys did a great job. Thanks for sharing so much. Uh, for our audience, just as a recap, we heard from five of the 11 federal agencies that are part of the interagency working group. And just a, a snippet, if you will, about either their existing authorities and programs or the uh, uh, the billions of dollars coming through the infrastructure bill. Uh, so more to come on all that. We heard about things like technical assistance and planning grants that are available. We heard about loans uh, and, and grants uh, that are available. Uh, we heard about uh, a range of different kinds of support that the federal government can provide from that fundamental infrastructure. There was a lot of discussion on broadband, uh, but also uh, how do you uh, create that catalytic environment for business development and economic growth? And then finally, we heard a bit about um, uh, uh, specifically industry verticals and the workers uh, and workforce training associated with that. So a lot of resources, we just uh, scratched the surface. Um, but uh, in the afternoon, we are going to have some breakouts of which many of our federal officials will be available uh, both to facilitate those conversations, but also for, to provide their input. And so with that, I want to thank them all again. And now we're going to wrap up our program here. Uh, thank you, Maris, for putting some, some links in the chat for the breakouts. Let's uh, launch our final poll. Uh, again, this is optional, uh, but if you could, could, could give us some quick feedback. Uh, that would help us for developing future events like this. So thank you for that. And um, when the team is ready, I would say, why don't we uh, roll our uh, closing remarks video uh, from Rocky Atkins, the senior advisor to Governor Bashir.
So with that, I want to uh, extend a, a hearty uh, thank you to our uh, good partner in the governor's office. They have been very helpful in organizing this event. I want to again put in a plug for the afternoon uh, breakout sessions. You have them on the screen there and would encourage you to participate. I, I want to thank our attendees and stakeholders that helped us to develop a program for today. Thank you so much for your engagement before and during this event. Um, and thanks to all of our speakers and participants, uh, the federal and the non federal folks. Uh, you really made the conversation rich today. Thank you for bringing all that information uh, to the table to share with our audience. So, with that, why don't we go ahead and adjourn for today? Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.